expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod, and we are webcasting to you live from the Center for Autism and Related Disorders headquarters in Tarzana, California. It's Wednesday. It is August 15th. Welcome to the show. We're going to be with you live for the next three hours talking about topics having to do with the autism spectrum and hopefully helping you to become more efficient, more effective at helping whatever child you're working with in your life that's on the autism spectrum reach their full potential. Whether you're a parent, a teacher, a practitioner, we know that you are interested in problem solving, seeing what's possible, reaching that full potential, and being a really active member of the team. Uh, somebody who pulls their weight on the team and maybe even leads the team. Because uh, the one thing that we know for sure is that it takes a team, right? I'm, I'm put, making us live here so that our question feature is open. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more, but I didn't want to, I wanted to let you know why I was preoccupied. <laughs> I realized I didn't have it open. You guys can't ask questions yet, but you can now. I just push the button, you can ask questions. Uh, we are, we talk about a lot of different things here on the show, and I just want to be abundantly clear that if you're a first time viewer, you're tuning in and going, what is this thing? We cover news stories. Uh, we cover a lot of topics having to do with ABA, applied behavior analysis. And I like to remind you why we talk about ABA because ABA is the only scientifically proven effective treatment for autism. Now that sets it apart in in respect to the fact that science has shown it. So there are so many things out there, right? And I never want to make it sound like ABA is the only game in town, but it is the only game in town that has been scientifically proven to be effective for all of our kids. And by effective, I mean reaching progress, that if we use the tools that surround ABA in a really creative, child-specific way, and that's super duper important that we understand that it's not a cookie cutter. I think that that's one of the big pluses about it, and I'll be honest with you, I as a parent who had ABA treatment in my home, it was one of the things that I particularly loved because when I was talking to other people about my child, what I was hearing was uh, from other places, I was hearing, well, with autism, with autism, and, and in my heart I was thinking, well, but my child isn't all of autism. I don't know about you, but that just kind of irks me when people say, well, oh, you know, I had a child that I worked with that had autism last year, and, you know, so we're going to apply the same things and I go really because they're so different our kids are so different and their reactions to things are so different I, I you know the perfect example I remember meeting somebody um, and being at several different birthday parties with the same person because you know socially that's what happens and uh, I noticed that this person was hugging all the other little kids all the time just a very huggy huggy person but not hugging my child and it, you know how that starts to eat at you and you go well, what you know there's something here what's going on and I finally said something to her and said, hey, hug my child too, okay, while you're hugging those other ones because I don't want him to feel left out and I was kind of thrusting it and she said, oh, oh, I thought that kids with autism don't like to be hugged because I know somebody who has autism and he, you know, reacts negatively. And I said, oh, yeah, that's some kids, not my child. My child needs to be hugged all the time. Like it helps him to focus the more you hug him. So hug my child. And she was 
just mortified that she had not been hugging my child and that he not only liked it, needed it, like it would help him. And um, it was a real lesson for me that, you know, people are going to respond to my child sometimes like they would to the other child's issues, sensory issues, um, and that I need to advocate for him in that sense. But my point is, all our kids are different and they need different things and they need for people to go about it in a different way. And ABA makes that really possible, it gives you a set of tools and says, you know, here are some creative ways and then you can be creative beyond that with it and reach that individual child and help them to overcome the obstacles that are in their way to build skills and diminish skills that are making it harder for them to access the kinds of things that they want to. So that's why I love ABA um, for that and many other reasons. I mean, quite Quite honestly, my son had five years of ABA in our home from the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. And I say all the time, I refer to it as the autism miracle in my living room. And I also say, you know, we got our child back. I watched my child slipping away from me. It was like sand through my fingertips. He was just going away every day, like a piece of him missing. And then we started ABA, and it was like getting pieces back and fitting them in and getting to know my child again and getting to have my child back. I have a child that I didn't think was going to talk, and I have a child who talks. I had a child that I didn't think was going to be able to show empathy. I have a child who shows empathy. I had a child that I didn't think was going to be able to go to neurotypical school and have friends and communicate his feelings, and I have all of those things. Is my child still working on things? Yes, he is. Is he ever going to be perfect? I, we're not shooting for perfect, right? But I don't want him to have obstacles in his way because of autism. And, and every day we get closer and closer to that moment. Um, and that's a wonderful thing in my life. And I want that for you. I'll just be 100% honest, I want that for you. And because of the tools that we've been given and because of the tools that are available online, and I'm talking about specifically CARDI learning and skills, I know that you can do that, that you have the ability, um, it's a lot of work, not going to lie to you, not going to sugarcoat that at all. Um, this is not uh, a leisurely Sunday drive through the park, but man, this is a journey that's worthwhile taking. Uh, so we do talk about ABA a lot because I do think of it as the autism miracle in my living room. And we have a lot of experts come in. ABA is not the only thing we talk about because we talk about the whole journey, about uh, what this takes financially, what this takes emotionally, uh, the toll that this takes on all of your relationships, not just with your significant other, but with your friends and your family. Um, and we bring experts in to talk to you and answer questions that we think will be useful to you and that you have asked for. And that's the key, that if you speak up, uh, use your voice and tell us, hey, you know what I need some support in or what I need some help in, whether it's a resource that you need in your area and we'll hunt it down for you, or you need to hear experts talking about uh, elopement and wandering, which is, you know, we're going to be talking a little bit about that later on today. Um, you know, if it's toilet training, if it's challenging behavior, if it's biting, if it's kicking, you know, what what's going on? Tell us what's going on. We're never going to give you child specific advice because that would be a disservice to you and your child, but we want to hook you up to answers and potential answers and places that you can look for answers and some, you know, beginning understanding of why what's happening is happening and what kinds of things are available to you. So that's what we're here for. I am not an expert in autism or ABA or any of those things, but as a parent who's been on this trip for a while, I know how important it is for you to have access to experts. So that's what I'm here for, to provide that access and be the go-between, be your conduit to those kinds of things. And, and I love being able to do that with you. You guys are teaching me so much and I appreciate you being on this journey with me because I go home every day to my luscious little boy and, and I'm trying to apply as much of what I learned here as I can. I don't have it all right. Uh, please know that I, uh, <laughs> I you know, 
Uh, there are moments where I sit there and go, I know better than this. Why, why am I nagging? I still want to nag. Uh, and I'm just admitting it. Okay, but you can participate in this conversation before I digress too far. Uh, you can participate in the conversation in lots of different ways. If you're watching us right now on autism-live.com, I have opened the live stream so that you can ask questions right now. And I see that we already have some questions. Uh, really excited. Uh, and we'll, we'll take a look. I, I know somebody who has uh, wants to be on the show and that's fabulous if you want to be on the show right into us um okay so if it's if you're watching on autism hyphen live you will see that right now there's a box that says shannon is answering and there's a box below it uh you can type in whatever you would like there hit enter and it magically appears on my screen i have the ability if you've written things that are personal information to take your personal information out and then post it so just know it doesn't go immediately on the screen before you it, it goes through me first which is a good thing right so if you have personal information that you want to send Send me you can um, say here's where you can get a hold of me to get back to me personally and I won't post that uh, okay so that's on autism hyphen live.com if you are watching on autism hyphen live.com and it says rebroadcast because the majority of the hours of the day we're on three hours live but the majority of the hours of the day we're not live you're seeing rebroadcasts uh, you can still get a hold of us through this email that Emily has put on the screen for you and we enjoy your emails we get back to you as soon as we possibly can covered on the next available live show i know you guys have written in some questions that we're going to be sharing later on today just got to squeeze it in because we got a lot going on today and uh so that's one of the ways you can get a hold of us there are other ways as well you can phone us uh for those of you who don't particularly like to type uh give us a call if it's during the live show you can be patched in and ask the question live of the expert we're gonna have evelyn gould here at the top of the next hour she is a bcba a board certified behavior your analyst she's a great person to ask questions so she will be with us and she's going to be talking specifically about parent training but she'll field your questions as well and you can talk directly to Evelyn and Evelyn is just one of the nicest people on the face of the earth so uh, take advantage of that you could also Skype in with us by the way and then if you have camera on your computer you can even be here with us uh, your picture as well on Autism Live and we enjoy that we Skype with people almost on a daily basis e around the world we're international Skyping now it's very exciting you can also talk to us on Facebook we have a new Facebook page Autism Live we appreciate your likes on there if you go and, and check us out. We also um post a lot of stuff on the autism live site if you missed the interview that we did with justin and zev from the amazing race last week well you really need to see it because uh i made a terrible mistake and didn't hit reply all so i only sent the message to justin saying don't wear green because <laughs> we shoot on a green screen and when we put up green you become a hollow person and so zev because i didn't hit reply all zev did not get that message and so what you see is zev is a floating head it is like the I am so humiliated but Zev and Justin thought it was so much fun that it almost I'm almost glad that that happened because they had such a good time with it so there we go uh, in any case in any case uh, you can uh, check that out on Facebook it's right there uh, and a lot of other clips as well and you can tweet with us and I know we got a question on Twitter last night that we're gonna be trying to squeeze in if, if not today then we'll do it on Monday because we're this is the last show of the week this week um, because we're changing things in the studio a little bit uh, in any case so Facebook with us tweet with us all of those ways are available we appreciate your interaction with us there's your there's the Twitter address and I mentioned that you could be watching us on autism live.com and I do think that that is the preferable way when you're watching live from 9 in the morning till noon Pacific time to watch us but if you're not watching live there is a cornucopia of <laughs> there are a cornucopia cornucopia of ways in which you can watch us blip tv is one of them we have our own channel there and you can go back and search a topic you can uh put in toilet training and all of the videos around toilet training will come up if you want to know about biting you want to see a particular interview with a particular person holly robinson pete or dr amy kenzer you can search those topics on blip.tv you can also search those topics by the way on our youtube channel i really love 
of you know when you're on YouTube because then if you watch it and you go wow this really I, I would like to talk about this with some one of the people on my team and then you can share it really easily you can share it you can post it to your Facebook um, pause it rewind it all those lovely things that you can do it's really useful and by the way, you can also download us for free on iTunes. Uh, I mentioned that on iTunes it's for free. It's for free everywhere. All of the ways, including asking the questions, this is all a free service provided to you uh, by the Center for Autism and Related Disorders to answer questions, to get the information out to you that you need, uh, and to hear what kinds of information you want, you want more information about quite honestly and we are also available on Ustream so all of those different ways in which you can participate ask questions answer questions have a ball um, for anybody who has ever felt frustrated and felt like I don't have any I don't know who to ask I don't know where to go I don't know what to do don't feel that way anymore you have at least this way um, and we appreciate your patience because sometimes when we're hooking you up with an expert because sometimes you email a question and it is so outside my scope that even me asking the expert and ferrying you back the answer I don't want to play telephone and mess something up for you so we'll hand it off to an expert and it takes them a couple of days to get back to you but they will um, you gotta love that, right? <laughs> I wish that I had had that opportunity when we were in the early days of autism. Uh, I, I, I would have really appreciated that because I needed it, man. I can remember sitting from time to time and uh, in front of the computer and saying, I don't even know what to ask. I don't know where to ask. I don't know who to ask. Um, and so I would just Google, Google autism hope. Autism hope and see what would come up because um, that's where I was and then other times I would uh, Google autism grants <laughs> you know because sometimes it was more financial than anything else but uh, in any case we want to be a resource for you for anything that you need um, you don't have to you don't you can Google things you absolutely can but you don't have to if you don't want to anymore you can write to us. Please participate. Okay, we like to start every morning with something we call the jargon of the day. This is the time of day when we take on one word, one phrase, one anagram, and we try to demystify it. We try to make friends with it. We try to come to terms with it. Just at least get a little bit more of a foothold into understanding what it is that they're saying when the experts are talking to us about our own children. Right? Um, so uh, all this week we've been talking about autism in the classroom because for a lot of us, a lot of people's kids went back to school today. Um, I know my child starts back to school tomorrow. <gasps> uh, it's a time that can be joyous and happy. It's a time that can be really stressful. And I think unfortunately for a lot of autism parents, it is a very stressful time. So we've been trying to give you some terms this week to help you with what I call alphabet land. I'm a former teacher uh, and I admit that uh, with pride, I admit that, um, but it is alphabet land and I remember starting to teach and people using these terms and going, really, seriously? Um, but. I, you know, even I am still in the in the weeds sometimes, so to speak, with some of the jargon that surrounds educational speak. Uh, so, I, but there are some terms that I was familiar with going in to this journey, like an IEP, which we talked about on Monday, an individualized education program or plan. Um, but today's term is one that I wasn't familiar with. And I think it is at the very crux of everything that we are going to do and everything we're going to be aware of. So this is the one besides ABA, understand what ABA is applied behavior analysis, but this is the second term that I most want you to emblaze. And even if you have to write it on your mirror at home so that every morning you brush your teeth, you look at it. Okay. The term is F B A, right? It's not the FBI, right? It's F B A. And what that actually means is, Functional Behavior Assessment. All right, this has the ability to change your life. And I'm not even trying to make it more dramatic, but 
asking for an FBA, getting an FBA, and getting a proper FBA has the ability to change your life, to change your child's life, to make everything different. Do I have your attention now? Because <laughs> yeah, it does. So what is an FBA? It is a multi-step problem-solving assessment process designed to determine the function of a behavior. All right. Well, what are we really talking about here? Um, our working definition for FBA is an essential process that helps us understand why a challenging behavior is happening so that we can change it effectively. We talk all the time about something called the three-term contingent. ABA, one of the main principles of ABA is that behavior happens not in a vacuum right? That there is a moment before the behavior happens. This, the, the, we call this the ABCs of the behavior. So the A is the antecedent. That's the moment before. Then the behavior happens. That's the B. And then there's a consequence always for the behavior. So something happens, antecedent, A. The behavior happens, B, consequence, right? ABC. ABC. We are all engaged in this ABC thing over and over and over every single day. All of us, all of us, and our kids on the autism spectrum are engaged in this all the time as well. And when we see a challenging behavior, and by a challenging behavior, I'm like, fill in the blank. There are so many things that challenging behavior could be from your child hitting their head against the floor, from your child, it could be your child biting you, it could be your child kicking, it, be, it could be your child being in the car and when you're on the freeway screaming at the top of their lungs and you don't know why. It could be your child refusing to eat anything that is orange. It could be your child refusing to eat anything that's white. It could be your child refusing to eat anything anything that has any kind of a texture to it. You know, let's talk about all the millions of different things that the challenging behavior can be. And my question to you is, what's kicking your can today? If there was one thing that your child is doing today that you could go, if this could stop my life, I could take a breath. It wouldn't fix everything, but it would be a beginning and I would have more hope and I could I could get dinner cooked or I could sleep or I could get him to learn or I could get her to uh, listen to me or I, fill in the blank. What is it? All of that's challenging behavior. So it's the full gamut. And the thing we know, and, and, and I didn't know this, so if you don't know this, don't blame yourself, no judgments. But what I know now and what the scientists have known for many, 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 many years is that if we take a look at this behavior, we can figure out what the function of this behavior is. And every single behavior has a function. That behavior is communicating something. There is some sort of paycheck for that behavior or it wouldn't keep happening. Sometimes we engage in random behavior and it happens once and it doesn't serve any purpose and we don't do it again. But in order for a behavior to happen again and again and again, it definitely has a paycheck. Um, and if it's working in some way, why would you stop, right? And by the way, this is true for our kids with autism, just like it's true for us. Uh, for people who smoke cigarettes, there is a paycheck for them and they're not going to stop smoking if that paycheck keeps coming on a regular basis, right? It just stands to reason. So what an FBA does is looks at what's the paycheck for this behavior. And as soon as you know what the paycheck of the behavior is, man, you're in the driving seat because then you can change one element of this three-term contingent or several elements of the three-term contingent and you will see the behavior change. It is not a magic trick. I know it sometimes it seems like a magic trick, but we can change behavior and they change behavior all the time. It is an absolutely amazing thing to watch. But so if we see, let's say that the, the behavior that you're seeing that is just driving you bonkers, I, let's go back to the example of, uh, cause this was a real example that a parent gave me at one point that she would get in the car to drive her son someplace and he would be all strapped into the back seat and she would get onto the freeway and randomly, not all the time, not every day, not every time of the day, but her child would start to scream. So she'd be driving along the freeway and from the back seat comes this like a siren. And it would scare her half to death. 
and she said, I'm afraid I'm going to get into an accident. And it makes me crazy. And once, she's, once he starts screaming, he won't stop. And I don't know what to do. And she was literally at the end of her rope about it. And she had contacted me because um, she went to an expert. And I'm using that term really loosely. Uh, but she went to somebody who billed themselves as an autism expert and said, what should I do? And this person who I'm going to call a quack, hmm, there I am, I just said it, <laughs> um, you know me, I don't like to mince words, said to her, well, the next time he does that, pull the car over on the freeway and make him get out of the car. I'm not making this up. And, and the mother said, I'm not going to do that because he's going to get hit by a car. He's clearly in distress when that happens. I'm not that kind of parent. I'm not doing that. And I said, good for you, because you should never do that. That would never, and I can't imagine who on earth would tell you to do that. But, I, you know, I like to have an open mind about most people, but I said, don't listen to anything else that person says. That's not safe. That's not logical. And my suggestion was you need to get a BCBA, a board certified behavior analyst to do an FBA because we don't know why this child is screaming. But the one thing that I'm 100% sure of is that the child was screaming for a reason. It may have been that the child was screaming because the, you know there was a stretch of road and that there are trees and that it was making him dizzy and he didn't know where to keep his eye focused and it was making him dizzy. It may be that you know it took a certain amount of time and the seatbelt was cutting into him and he was screaming. It may be that he was hungry. Um, it may be that he remembered something that like an accident that almost happened. I don't know. I don't know, but I, I know for sure that there was a, if for him to have done it over and over and over again, something was going on and there was some sort of a paycheck for it, for him. And that, you know, for an F FBA. And so uh, my understanding, you know, and, and I haven't had a whole lot of contact with the parent was that an FBA was done. And I don't, I can't tell you what the result was, except that the behavior stopped. The behavior stopped that they were able to look at it say the function of the behavior is this um, a lot of times what will happen is that functional communication skills are put in to be able to teach the child how to communicate what they're doing what's going on instead of the screaming they're taught to appropriately ask for the thing that they want um, they change sometimes the antecedent before sometimes they change the consequence for it but what ends up happening, because it is absolutely tied to what the function is, is that it's efficient. The behavior changes quickly, really quickly. And if we try to change behavior without first looking at what the function is, we run the risk of making it worse. Uh, we absolutely run the risk of being completely inefficient and not changing anything and wasting our time and their time and putting them at risk and putting ourselves at risk. So getting an FBA is one of the best gifts that you can give yourself and your child that there ever was. And I bring this up within, you know, our, our topic that we're about to go over is that uh, we're talking about autism in the classroom because each and every one of you, if your child is in a classroom setting, has the ability to ask for today ask for an FBA. Ask for it in writing. If your child is engaging in challenging behavior and you're getting notes that are coming home from the teacher or the aide or the principal or whoever who says, you know, uh, we're concerned your child uh, was taken out of the classroom today or your child was in the principal's office or they got, you know, three check marks, their behavior, they're on red, uh, whatever it is that's happening or your child has been expelled because of behavior, whatever it is, if your child is engaging in the behavior and it happens more than once, ask for an FBA. Your school should be capable of doing an FBA. There should be someone on site who's capable of doing an FBA. And then you're going to do a behavior intervention plan that is tailored to the function of that behavior. And that's when you see a change in behavior. You are not a victim. You have this ability to ask for that FBA, and I can't tell you how many times I have seen, and you would think that the school would just do it. That's not the way it works. It just isn't. I don't know why. I don't know why, and I'm sure that that happens in some instances, but I really see that when it happens, it's parent 
or caretaker driven. Um, and I don't know whether it's because it's a resource and you've got to specifically ask for it, but I have seen so many children had their placement moved. They were included at least part of the day in a class and they had to be taken out and taken to the special education room. There's nothing wrong with being in the special education room, but I think that it's amazing what can happen when our kids are being mainstreamed and I would hate to see a child lose that ability, that opportunity because of a behavior that could be changed, right? Um, and if this behavior is happening at home and it's not happening at school, there are BCBAs you can call, write into us, tell us where you're at and we'll help to point you in a direction where you can look to find a BCBA and you don't have to ha have them come for, you know, uh, every week, but have them come in and do an FBA and help you to write a behavior intervention plan so that things can change and they can change quickly, you guys. It's an amazing, amazing thing. FBA, Functional Behavior Assessment. It's the way we get things done. It's the first step. It's the most important step. I mean, that follow through is big and important. You're not gonna make things happen unless you follow through with the behavior intervention plan, but if you have a behavior intervention plan that isn't based on the actual function of the behavior, it doesn't matter how well you follow through. So, um, FBA. FBA, Functional Behavior Assessment, ask for it. Anytime you have a problem, ask for it. Uh, don't leave home without it. <laughs> it's like that. Okay, uh, we always have a question of the day. Our question of the day today, what, if anything, would you like to change about your child's IEP? We talked about the IEP on Monday, the Individualized Education Plan. It's that document, that legal document that says what your child's working on, what your child what our, our expectations are for the entire year. There are benchmarks saying that by October, your child's gonna be this place on this skill. Because if they're not, we're gonna look and figure out what we need to change to get to that benchmark, right? Um, and it has the, the goals for the end of the year. Um, it also says what the services are, the extra services that your child is gonna get. So what, if anything, would you change about your child's IEP? Um, it's a great time of year that most of you had your IEP meetings in the spring, not everybody, but most everybody has them in the spring. And it's a great time of year right now while our kids are going back to school, that we pull out the IEP, reread it again, look at the behavior intervention plan and say, is this the, what we think is really ideal for this child at this time? Is that really what we're talking about? Um, so uh, I'd love to hear from you guys. What would you like to change? I have an IEP meeting today. Uh, <laughs> I just want you to know that I'm, I'm here with you. I, I have to do these things too. And I have an IEP meeting. School starts tomorrow and I got an IEP meeting today. Woohoo! It's how we all want to spend the day before. I've been saying to you guys for a week now, I really want to get to the point where we do say that. We say, I have an IEP. Woo! How exciting is that? There's no stress. I'm not quite there yet, but I'm getting there. Um, and I will be honest with you, part of the reason why I'm there, A, I know that I've got a really good teacher, and man, that's a fabulous thing. B, I know that the staff on, on campus is, really is pulling for my child and is seeing the progress that he makes and believes in him. Gotta love that. And that I know that I have access to skills so I know appropriately what my child should be working on. That gives me great peace of mind. And that I now have the way to build, help be really effective building a BIP, a behavior intervention plan, because I have the, uh, on skills, there is a behavior uh, plan builder that's called Behavior Champ and uh, that just gives me peace of mind. So. In any case, but I'd love to hear from you. Write to us on Facebook. We're going to try to get time squeezed in here today to be able to tell, for you to tell us what you would change about your child's IEP. Hey, we always have a topic of the day. I already gave it away what the topic of the week is because it's back to school week for a lot of us. So autism in the classroom. And we're going to talk a lot about that. But, uh, you know, whenever we talk about things, I think it's important because I, well, let's put it this way. I know that a lot of you who are watching are parents. There's teachers that are watching too. But I think the vast majority of you are parents. And I think the teachers would agree that the parents are an important component of this. That we can talk endlessly about what needs to happen in the classroom. But 
there is a parent component to it because I don't always have control over everything that happens in the classroom, but there are a great many things as a parent I do have control over. So um, we're going to talk a lot today about what parents need to be doing. I know it feels like we just heap more and more responsibility, but you know, when we truly are efficient and effective in doing the right kinds of things, it doesn't feel like a responsibility. It feels like, wow, I just got to have some control over something. I don't know about you. That's fabulous for me. I love to have control over whatever I can have control over. Uh, it's a great thing. All right. So some of the things we're going to talk about today, we got a motor tip for you, uh, a healthy eating tip. And of course, uh, during the 10 o'clock hour, we're going to have Evelyn Gould, who's going to be with us, and she's going to talk about parent training and how important it is for parents to be an active role in this and how they can get the proper training so that they really are a member of the team um, in a gratifying way. Because, you know, Evelyn, she always allows us to have the space to feel what we're feeling. I just love that about her. And then during the 11 o'clock hour, we have Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. My co-host, Nancy Allspot Jackson, will be here. And uh, we're going to be taking on during that hour the topic of wandering and elopement. And um, this is a very prevalent problem in the autism community. It's not just the little ones. Um, some of the older kids elope and wander, and it's a very, very scary thing. Both Nancy and I have children on the autism spectrum who at one point were elopers, and we know how terrifying it is. So got some interesting different things uh, to be talking about. We have a special guest who's going to be with us in the studio uh, offering uh, information about a product that can be helpful and useful if you have a wanderer. So, uh, you're going to want to be here with us for that hour if you have a child that either wanders or you think is capable of wandering because until, you know, it's one of those things where all of our children, all of our children are capable of it. Um, and, and when they do it, it's too late, right? Then you're, you know, so, uh, not to freak everybody out, but it's, it's a really important issue that we talk about it and, and look at it as behavior and figure out what we're going to do about it. So we've got information about that. Um, and we may later during that hour show you a video that we have um, of one of the gentlemen that we saw at ABAI, but we won't show that to you now. We want to say, wait that wait for later for that. In any case, we're going to take a short break. When we come back, we're going to do the motor tip. I also, because I was not here yesterday, we have to finish up on our token economy that we started on Monday. If you have your um, laminating sheets and you have uh, your other sheets, we're, we're going to show you how I'm going to put this together so that my son can start using it tomorrow. Uh, we're going to squeeze all of that in somehow. So stick with us. Currently in the United States, one in 88 children is affected by autism. One in 88 means something different when your child is the one. Recovery is possible. Hi, I'm Shannon Penrod, host of Autism Live, an online show about autism broadcast by CARD, the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. I'm also the mother of a child with autism. My beautiful son, Jem. You know our old joke, guess what? Chicken butt. Chicken butt. So we're going to take the chickens. But things weren't always so easy. I remember when Jem was first diagnosed with autism. I used to lay awake at night in bed and pray for someone or something that could help us to get our child back. My prayers were answered by Dr. Doreen Grampichet and the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. CARD treats autism and other related disorders using the principles of ABA, Applied Behavior Analysis, which is the only scientifically proven effective treatment for autism. It is also recommended by the American Academy of Pediatrics and the U.S. Surgeon General. About a year after we started treatment with CARD, we were able to see tremendous improvement and we got our child back. What grade are you in? Second. You are a smart cookie, huh? Mm -hmm. Do you like school? Uh, yeah. Do you have any good friends? Yeah, Oscar. Oscar is your best friend? Yeah. And my child is just one of thousands to benefit from CARD ABA therapy. 
Across the nation and around the world, children are making amazing progress and being given the keys to unlock their full potential. We are extremely grateful for the amazing job CARD has done in helping our daughter. Our daughter today, just in four months, I think is a totally different child than when she started with CARD. I kind of see it as, it, it seems like her brain in a way was asleep and now that we've gotten so many services, um, we've seen her wake up. Did you have some gases? <laughs> Recovery is possible if you take the right steps, um, if you're willing to put in all the hard work. And seven and a half years, yeah, it's, it's a lot of work. It's worth every little bit, and um, CARD's been there with us every step of the way. I have two children with autism. I can't imagine a day without CARD or the therapists. Um, they've been so instrumental in helping us with our kids and, and shaping their lives and helping us help them. Thank you, Christy and Big Alex. <laughs> Thank you, Jackie and Mariana. We've tried other things before ABA, but the most beneficial thing has been ABA services, and I'd be the first person to tell any newly diagnosed family that you have to, you have to contact an ABA provider. And if you're lucky enough to have a card, you, you're very blessed. Recovery from autism is absolutely a possibility. We've been recovering children for over 20 years. It's just a matter of identifying the child's medical needs, understanding the child's sensory issues, and then teaching the child all of the skills they need in order to function normally. We know there's hope for autism. Autism is treatable and recovery from autism is possible. I'm, I'm doing craft projects. You see I'm like glued. <laughs> We're gonna, I probably should do this right now, but it's a mess, so I'm not gonna do it right now. Um, this is what I do during the commercial breaks here, in case you're wondering. Uh, usually I prep for the next segment, which this is coming up later on. In any case, it kind of goes with what we're about to talk about, because we're talking about motor skills, and the kinds of things, and I, we've been talking about autism in the classroom, and the kinds of things that parents can do at home to help to make things work better at school. And there are all these different things that we're gonna work on at home and that we're gonna try to uphold the consequences uh, that we have set up, whether it's in the classroom or at home. Um, but we always wanna be striving for setting the kids up for success for things and making it easier. There's nothing worse than having to go and do something for the first time when you feel inept and there's all kinds of things going on and you don't really know what you're doing, right? It's the reason why we rehearse in life, right? And then we rehearse in a wide variety of different things that we do, right? If you know that you have a very big, important presentation that you're gonna deliver and that you're delivering it to five people or 5,000 people, you're probably gonna take a couple of minutes to rehearse it, right? Even if you're just rehearsing it in your head, that you never stand in front of the mirror and say it, but everybody has different ways of rehearsing. Um, and we find that if we've had the opportunity, it's the reason why we do fire drills, right? Because there's gonna be stress in the moment that there's an actual fire and you don't wanna to have to rely on how you're thinking and feeling in that moment. You wanna have done it before so that at least your body knows how to react, right? So we do fire drills. Well, we can do the same kinds of things because with ABA and we talk about giving the child ample opportunities. It's just rehearsal. And when we talk about motor skills, it's a wide variety of things, right? We're talking about gross motor, which is all the big muscle stuff, whether it's running, jumping, kicking a ball, hitting a ball, um, all of that big muscle stuff. Uh, we talk about oral motor, the, uh, the amount of muscle that it takes to be able to produce words to be understood, very important that we're working on that with our kids. We talk about visual motor, being able to focus your eyes, move your eyes in a way so that you can visually understand the kinds of things that are before you. Um, but we also talk about fine motor. Fine motor is the stuff with your fingers. Um, this is opening a, a bottle cap. This is being able to zip up your pants. This is being able to have a pincer grasp to be able to pick up a raisin off of a, a table. It's the, the try grasp um, to be able to hold a pencil or a crayon to be able to draw in that way. And we really want to work with a child to find it gratifying to be able to use their hands and build the muscles. It's 
it's hard for kids sometimes because the pathway from the brain to the fingers, you know, it's being refined. And um, the child will get frustrated sometimes because it doesn't have the reward. Remember we said that in order for any behavior to be maintained, it has to be reinforcing. And for the child, they're trying to open the bottle and they really want what's inside the bottle, but they don't have the musculature to do it. And they fr sometimes will get so frustrated and give up and hand the bottle to us. And of course we open it for them, right? There's nothing wrong with that. That's not terrible. But in the meantime, we want to be doing something else to build those muscles because there's all kinds of things that are going to go hand in hand with development and getting these muscles built. And so we have to find things that are reinforcing. Well, one of the different things that we can do to encourage those finger and finer motions are things that involve lacing and beading and things like that. So you can go and buy if you want to spend money and, you know, I if you have the money to spend, they have those lacing cards. And I know that you tend to think, oh, but those are just for the girls. They're, some people call them sewing cards, um, where there are all these different shoelaces, right, that they have the, what is it called? Is it an egret or something at the end? I can't think what the word is. Uh, that at the end, there is a, a point when you can poke through and it makes it easier to go through. Um, and there are girl ones, but there are also boy ones. I know because we bought them for my son and we got ones that were really cool. I've long since given them away, but um, they were neutral and sports. Okay. We'll say that. So there might be a picture of uh, a, a football guy and he's running and then there would be a separate little football and you had to sew the football to the card um, so that he was holding the football. And then there was one with the basketball, on and on, right? Um, and I thought that was particularly cool that it was, you know, there was a purpose to sewing the thing on. And it really helps if the child, if, here we go, if the child finds it reinforcing to sew the football on, then they're going to be willing to work through you know, this, this motion that they have to do to poke through and then reach around and pull out the back. It's, it also is working on visual motor because it's understanding that something is there and you have to turn it over to look at it, um, or to feel around to do it. Right. So very useful in a lot of different ways, um, to sew the thing on. Now, all children are not going to find it reinforcing to sew a football onto it. They're just not. Um, but there are lots of different things that we can do to help a child to be able to do this motion and find it reinforcing. Um, from, depending on what time of year it is, you know, we, uh, <laughs> this is like, prime preschool and kindergarten stuff, right? Think about all the things that they do and you think, oh, it's an arts and crafts project. Mm, sorry, it's so ever so much more than that. Um, but stringing beads. Uh, so if you have a child who likes to make a bracelet, and sometimes the boys do, make the beads something really reinforcing. Make it their favorite color or make it a bunch of different colors. If they like making a rainbow, you can be working on the colors at the same time. You can do this with tubed macaroni and you can put food coloring on the macaroni to make it be different colors. Um, uh, there are so many different things that you can string. If you want to, you can string marshmallows. You can string candy. Uh, you know, some people during the holidays string popcorn. I think that that one's a little bit harder because you need a very sharp needle, uh, whereas you don't, you can get a big old plastic needle to go through something like marshmallows. Um, if it's that you know, different kids and you want to make it reinforcing and, and we're about to do the healthy eating tip here. But, um, when you're working on a skill and if it's something that you really want to start, you could have it be treat oriented. Um, and depending on, you know, what your child can have and what they can't have, uh, you know, you, you could be stringing marshmallows and every time they string four marshmallows, they get to eat a little baby marshmallow, right? Keep it reasonable because you don't want to sugar them out. Um, and if they can't have sugar, make it, make it something else. But those kinds of skills, it can be really fun, you guys, especially if you sit down and do it with them and it's really helpful. It's not just mamby-pamby, you know, 
Uh, even, I mean, it's a different group of muscles, but still the finger muscles. You know how we used to make those paper chains? Uh, and you can do paper chains with little, little kids, right? You can do all the pre-cutting yourself and just have them pushing down on it and holding down on, put, you know, weaving it through and pushing down and holding the paste. You can do the paste yourself and have them hold. That builds hand skills to weave it through um, and then hold it down. Now with older kids, you might think to yourself, well, well, you know, I've got a kid who's 10 and we don't have the motor, we don't have the motor skills, but he's writing, um, you know, he can type on the computer, but we just need to build up some hand skills. You can still be do, doing paper chains with an older child and have them, you know, write something on the paper chain, whether it's, you know, you've got a sick relative and you write things on the paper chain to send to them, or they can be writing things that they want. Um, you know, uh, I know somebody who did a paper chain with their child and every time they did something good, they got to pull one piece of paper off the paper chain and it allowed them to have a snack or 10 minutes of videos or whatever. And the child had done all of that writing. So not only were they working on the tripod grass, but also working on weaving it through. Be creative, be creative, but those hand and motor skills and beating things. And of course, the older the child and the better they get at it, you know, you can start with a really thick cord with a really thick bead um, and starting it that way or the paper chain and work into having a very thin wire that they're beading something onto a thin wire. It can be really great for those kinds of skills. Uh, and by the way, there are a whole bunch of lessons in the skills curriculum if you need suggestions about things like that as well uh, under the motor skills. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to do the healthy eating tip. Don't forget Evelyn Gould at the top of the hour with us. A boy born in Joplin, Missouri was fascinated by anything with wheels and a motor. The odds of him going on to fascinate millions with his talent? One in 260,000. The odds of this born racer having 157 career top 10 finishes in NASCAR? One in 125 billion. The odds of him winning both the Daytona 500 and the Brickyard 400 in the same year? One in 195 million. The odds of a child being diagnosed with autism? One in 88. I'm NASCAR driver Jamie McMurray, and my niece has autism. Learn more at autismspeaks.org slash signs. Welcome back. I'm still in craft project mode because um, I'm going to show this to you in just a couple of minutes. But I wanted to take a second to talk about a healthy eating tip. And, um, you know, one of the different lesson areas that we talk about from time to time, and I, when I'm saying, you know, you want to prioritize. You really want to prioritize about what kinds of things you're working on. If you only have 10 hours a week in which to work on ABA and you're doing it by yourself, then you may look and say, you know, you look at the skills program and it says, well, you know, your child is it's age appropriate for them and skill appropriate for them to work on gardening, but you think to yourself, uh, you know, in the realm of things, I'm going to work on building conversation and repairing conversation. And that's a perfectly understandable thing to do. But I'm going to make a case for gardening here uh, in the healthy eating tip. Uh, and I'm going to make a case for at least growing one plant because there's all kinds of things that can be learned from growing a plant. First of all, it's a science project. It can be very reinforcing to your child, whether it's a flower or something that they eat. And you can um, plant a seed and have them water it and have them see that there is a consequence, you know, uh, cause and effect. I plant the seed and I water it and the plant comes up. And and the problems come along the way that you're working on problem solving. And it can be as simple as just one plant in a pot, depending upon your circumstances, you know, how much time and availability you have. Um, you know, at some point, the plant is going to do something, right? Um, you know, there's de very definitely going to be consequences. It's not always positive. You know, the plant may die. That's not the worst thing that could happen because you're teaching your child about, well, you know, sometimes we don't know why and we start another one, you know, problem solving going, okay, this didn't work. So we're not giving up that perseverity, right? Perseverance. That's the word I want. Um, and 
uh, it can be really, really useful. But something that I think is really um, a great lesson and very reinforcing to kids at this particular time of year. Um, and of course, it's going to depend on where you live, but in a lot of places in the world right now, we're into harvest. And so you can call around and ask if there is a farm that allows you to come and pick. And if you're like me, you know, I want to know, are they spraying? Are they using pesticides? Because I don't really want to take my child and expose them to a bunch of chemicals and stuff. So I'm kind of careful careful about that. Um, but it's a great time of year to go out and pick places will charge in different ways and you want to ask all the different questions. Um, but some places they charge like $3 for you just to come in and look at the gardens. Um, and you can come in and look and you don't get to pick anything. There are other places, there's one place in particular that I've taken my child before where they charge $3 to get in and they take you on this hay ride up to the fields and you can pick whatever you want from certain, you know, they say these areas are ready to pick and you can pick whatever you want and then you come back and weigh it and you pay for the produce that you picked and take it home and you cook it up or wash it up and serve it for dinner. Um, it's a really, really educational thing to take a child and show them where their food comes from. I, I think, you know, and, and as I'm thinking through like all the different areas on the spectrum, whether you have a child who you're pretty sure just like isn't getting it, food um, is an emotional thing and I know there are some kids who don't want to eat or don't want to eat certain things but their food is still it's a part of our economy with our kids isn't it um, whether it's that it's aversive or they like certain foods but imagine um, taking a child and there are a whole bunch of sensory things and you have to be prepared I'm not saying just go willy-nilly and go off to the farm and think it's going to be wonderful for everybody it may not you may see some challenging behavior because there's a lot of sensory things and kids may not like to get muddy um, but if you're prepared for it that it could be really really educational and I, I don't think that we can take our kids too early to do that kind of thing. I can remember taking Jem when he was really little and nonverbal and taking him to a fruit farm so that we could pick blueberries. And I remember getting there and it was Mother's Day and my husband had to work and it was the thing that I was going to do. I was going to spend Mother's Day with my child in the orchard and picking uh, blueberries and picking um, the other thing was nectarines and peaches. And it's a day that I will never forget as long as I live because uh, there were parts of it that were particularly challenging. I'm not going to lie to you that I'm not going to say this is all going to be hearts and flowers and roses, but there were moments when we were taking the blueberries off of the bushes when I saw him realize, oh, these things that I really enjoy eating, this is where they come from. And it opened a door um, for some curiosity for some other things. You know, did it, did it change anything immediately? Did it change, you know, did he suddenly become verbal? I, no, 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 we're not talking about that. But I saw something in him then that I, I, I just remember thinking, okay, there's just ever so much more going on here than I might have thought or that some people might have led me to believe. This child uh, is interested in things. And, uh, you know, the first time that he pulled a beet up out of the ground uh, was just so exciting to the point where, you know, this year we got, I've talked about it before on the show, we got a community garden plot. Um, and you know what's hilarious about this is that now, because I've taken my son on a regular basis to do these kinds of things and, and you know, he's all in farm mode and here's what we're going to do. And it's so exciting now because it's ours and we get to make decisions and we plan uh, where, where we're going to plant and what we're going to plant. We talk about it. Uh, but we took daddy to the garden and we're pulling up beets and carrots. And, uh, and the other day we went and we're, the, you know, it's just land of zucchini now uh, to the point where I said I'm going to start leaving them on people's desks just to get rid of them. And uh, they're making fun of me, but I'm gonna. <laughs> and, uh, and my husband, who has not spent a lot of time gardening or near farms, was like, 
whoa, you grew that? Like that came from that plant? And my son was so excited and telling him about it. So it's, some, it's a skill that is built over time. And I do think that when our children know where our food comes from, they have a different appreciation for it. I don't think there is likely to be throwing it off the, y yes, that's not gonna happen with a child that is still struggling to under, res, understand receptive language right away. But I think it is a lesson over time that is worthwhile. It also can be, you know, it has the potential to be peaceful and enjoyable. It has the potential to be something that is uh, a sensory battleground, but um, it's worth it. It's a lesson that's worth it. Take them to where the, um, where the food is grown to show them and introduce them to the farmer and uh, you know let them see with their own two eyes and if possible let them pick it and if you really can't get to that kind of thing i really want to encourage you to get one pot um and get a seed from somebody uh or buy a package of seeds it'll be the best two dollars because it'll be a lesson that grows over time and even if you plant them one at a time over the next two years it'll be a really really great lesson in ways that we can't even imagine okay we got to take a break and uh when we come back we're going to be joined by Evelyn Gould. I am going to find time to show you this craft project that I'm working on that I'm making a mess on my desk here. Can I tell you? Um, this is the token economy that we started on Monday. If you still want um, to have one of the sheets so that you can get the cutouts for these emailed to you, then you can just email us here at uh, Autism Live and we will send, you have to specify, do you want the small, medium, or large? It's all free. And um, if you want the boxes blank or what I had put for my child, you can see that I have laminated the base for it. I have put the, I like to put the fuzzy stuff on the card and the the sticky or the, the stuff that has the scratchy stuff on the Velcro on the things that you attach. It's hard to see here. You can see a black hole here. It's actually green, but we're on the green screen. So this one is for behavior and it will always start on green in the morning. Um, but when I'm not using stickers, they go right on the back here. Um, so that when he goes off to school, he's got all of his stickers, but this is how the sticker chart will start in the morning. I, I still need to put Velcro here and put what he's working for there. Um, but that will be in that hole. And um, as he goes through the day, um, once he's done the morning, if he has done well and he feels that he has gotten earned a sticker, he'll put his little smiley face there and the teacher will approve that. Um, and then he'll do recess. And if he feels that he's done well during recess, he will get a sticky. If he doesn't, if the teacher disagrees, then it comes off and it goes on the back. He didn't get it. Um, and we're setting the criteria that he has to get all five areas and stay on green in order to get the thing that he's working for, which he gets to choose. Token economy, if for some reason during the day, the teacher needs to say to him, you need to be on yellow, warning for your behavior. She'll say, you need to be, you're gonna be, you're on yellow. He'll put his yellow sticker there to remind himself and he's gotta work to get back on green. If he ever gets to red, I tell them to call me. <laughs> if he's on red, I want to know about it right away. Um, I don't think in the last four years he's ever been on red. Um, <clears throat> he's been on yellow, you know, it happens. Um, but I don't think he's ever been on red in the last four years. So there we go. Um, and when he comes home, he actually at the gate, he hands me this and I get to see, okay, you had a great day. We get to go home and you get to play video games or whatever it is that he's chosen. Um, that's assuming that the green is there. Again, it's green. You're seeing black, but it's green. Um, so this is the token economy that he's going to start with. I have it in bigger um, if you would like it, and then you can customize it yourself. Uh, and I'm just sticking it between two sheets of laminate and cutting them out, not, not having to heat anything. Um, so you can do it with two sheets of laminate. You probably can do it with one. I did mine with one. 
uh, which takes two sheets because there's a bottom and a top. So that is two sheets, two sheets. Okay, uh, so we'll take a break. If you have questions about this, write in and I can answer questions. I'm using two different kinds of Velcro. I'm using the circle ones, the sticky ones. And for the back, I just covered it with the, um, the long sheets. I'll finish this up so you can see it before we're done today. And we'll come back with Evelyn Gould. So stick with us. And does that feel funny in your hands? Do you want to go swing? Jack Riley. Jack. Good looking. Thank you. I accept that he has sensory issues. I completely accept that he has speech delays. All of the symptoms and the things that lead up to the word autism, I have no problem accepting that. And I have no problem um, addressing that and being aggressive about it and making those things happen. It's the word itself that I have a hard time with, um, mostly because of my perception. And, and I imagine the perception of a lot of people that autism is Rain Man. I don't have my maple syrup either. I'm going to be without my maple syrup and my, and my toothpicks. It's um, all these images that you see, you know, even when they put a child on on TV, it's a child who's so severe and doesn't hug his parents. And, and because our, our son does that, it's just hard for me to, to make that leap. Um, and then logically, I get it, it's a big spectrum and it's just a, a personal thing, but it's hard for me to say the word because you don't, you don't want to have, you don't want to admit anything It, makes it, it makes it real to say the word. And we knew it even before to a certain extent, um, you know, he would line up cars and... I'd walk on the knuckles of his toes a lot. I mean, I remember even having conversations saying, like, I'm sure he walks on the knuckles of his toes. I'm sure he lines up his, to his toys. Yeah, and the more times you say, oh, sure, then you find, eventually you've got to... He spins. ...draw a circle around those and say, okay, what does that add up to? So we, we always noticed that. We, he didn't point. He never pointed, never pointed, although we didn't realize that until we went through this process. If our yeah. pediatrician had asked us, you know, Eight, nine months yeah. ago, does your son point? We would have known a lot right then. We decided last fall to get Jack Riley tested for speech delay. We noticed that he wasn't saying a lot. He didn't say mommy, he didn't say daddy. He was a little different when we would take him out in public. So we contacted the regional center to get him evaluated for speech delay, in my mind. And that was the worst I thought it would be. So when they told us autism, I think that word was far worse than we ever expected. Yeah, I, re I remember I kicked the garbage can when we were outside. <laughs> my foot hurt. I remember that. And uh, that wasn't a very good day. How, how were they with letting you know that was the diagnosis? I guess in my recollection, and this is uh, me projecting quite a bit, but uh, they were, they pitied us. Yeah, it was, it was uh, uncomfortable. Um, and they're, they're talking sort of like I was 12 years old or something like that. Who knows how to deal with that kind of stuff? I mean, even if you're a professional and that's what you do all the time, I don't know. You don't know the people you're telling very well. There was a lot of the head shaking. And, you know, he's still the same beautiful child that you came here with, but yet they're sitting there like they're they just giving us a death sentence. Yeah, it's, all, it's almost like they just told us he had cancer or something. So I don't, I, I don't know if I'm reading that in or... I, I don't think that I like them that much. <laughs> I still don't think I do. And we didn't love that process either. They, we, they brought him in there and, and gave him 45 new toys and said he's more interested in the toys than he is in us. We Strange thought, we people thought that what, he never met. We thought what kid wouldn't be. But, um, but then in retrospect, in the hour and a half, two hours that he was there, he never once showed us one of the toys. He didn't come to us to engage us in any of it. And actually they did us a favor because we would have fought it. I mean, just in our heads we would have fought the autism diagnosis. We didn't. We wouldn't have, if had they told us that he's fine, we would have left and got him speech therapy and that's, that would have that's been probably it. probably yeah. We're, we're pretty numb about all of this. I mean, it, it, we found out November 2nd, it's four months. It's also kind of a mourning period, so I think we went, we went very numb for a while. Yeah. Uh, but we're coming out of that now too, where we're starting to, you know, click 
so that there are things that we can do. I mean, I think for that the unfortunate part for a while was that we were both thinking, um, come and help us, everybody, please. Mm-hmm. You know, we have this thing that we don't know how to deal with it and, you know, time's a ticket, come and help us, tell us. And, and now we're just kind of do it ourselves and, and we're the ones who know it best. And, you know, we can take all this information that people tell us and then we can adapt it to what we know will work for him. And, and he's, he's already responding. It's, yeah. it's slow, but... I, I personally forgot forgot for a while to enjoy him. I just took care of him Absolutely. all day, and uh, I wasn't having fun. Now I, I'm back to just how cute he is and how incredible that little thing he just did is and that smile and that the joy he gets out of one simple little thing. And uh, But for a while there, I forgot to do that. I just was getting through the day. Um, maybe he didn't want to notice. Maybe I didn't want to notice things because a lot of the points of the the A word, autism again. There's no one to talk to about it because even when you bring up the idea that's possible, your your family members, no, he's fine. They want to help you say no and deny it. He seems fine. He's just you know my son didn't talk to me. He was three and a half. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a lot of people. That's that so, was part of why we didn't even have him evaluated until we did because a lot of people would tell us that. Yeah, you know, and everyone tells me their son didn't speak till he was three and a half and wasn't potty trained till he was four and. So, you know, my kid normal, well, it's easy to deny it, but we're not denying it anymore. I ordered a pair of earrings, and they were puzzle pieces, because my son liked puzzles, and I thought, this is in honor of my son, I'll wear these earrings, they had the right colors, and I thought, this is great. And we were probably two, two days away from going to this diagnosis, and I'd done enough research to know what they might say. And it occurred to me that puzzle pieces were symbolic of autism. And I was like, I have to send them back. <laughs> this is terrible. I can't believe I've ordered autism earrings. Yeah. And didn't wear them for months. Uh, they sat there. I looked at them every day. And I thought, I'm going to put these earrings in today and, and accept it and move forward. And couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. That I can't wear them to OT because they'll think I'm just wearing autism earrings to you know, make a statement. And I finally started wearing them probably, what, two weeks ago? Yeah. So, I guess that means I'm getting used to the idea. I see it in adults now. Uh, I'm very conscious of it. Maybe it helps to just think everybody has it a little bit. We were getting Jack a haircut a few weeks ago. We, we still say the A word instead of autism. I'll say A word, which is A word. And this, well, that was for real, though. That, that, was, that was real. This, well, this 15 year old kid walks in. And Toy Story 3 is on, and there's little kids getting their hair cut, sitting on chairs and animals and whatever. And he starts talking out loud to whoever would listen, to, saying how much money Toy Story 3 had made, and, and it's the largest grossing in history, and blah, 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 blah. And then he goes, okay, I'll see you guys later. And he walked out, and I go, hey, word? And she goes, oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So at least we're at, we got a little sense of humor about it now. Are you watching Daddy Dance? <laughs> Welcome back to Autism Live, and we are joined now by the awesome and fabulous Evelyn Gould. She is a BCBA, a board certified behavior analyst, and uh, we just always appreciate the time that you are here when we have an opportunity to talk with you. And we are going to be talking about parent training in particular and how important it is for parents to be a part of the team. That's uh, specifically what I asked Evelyn to talk about today. But as always, we um, are interested in your questions. And we did have a question that came in during the night that somebody wrote in and said that their question is that they're six months into ABA therapy. Good for you. Congratulations. With a pretty good company and lots of emerging skills and control of behaviors. Woohoo! I mean, that's pretty fabulous. Uh, and the developmental preschool starts soon. Uh, their question was, what are your thoughts on taking a break from ABA to focus on OT, school, and speech? And I think that this is a really good question. I think that that is a question that comes up in a lot of people's minds. And I know I had a gut reaction to it. I was like, stop! <laughs> Don't! Um, and that's coming from me personally as a parent. But I know, Evelyn, you you know had a couple of things that you wanted to add. Yeah, I think um, if your child is, uh, is clearly showing progress and you're doing well with managing the behaviors and so on and, and you just don't want to stop something that's working, Yeah. Um, 
you know, you really, you really don't. It's working for your child. It's working for you. And I would, I would keep going. And it is the treatment of choice right mm -hmm. now. It is recommended, scientifically based treatment um, for autism. And your child, if your child's young, you know, you, you, you can't take that. You can't get that time back. Mm -hmm. um, it's really important to keep going. Yeah. And you can, you know, a, a little time can make such a difference. Yeah. And I, you know, I always go back to the example of when the doctor writes you a prescription for penicillin or some sort of antibiotic and they say you need to take this and this amount for this many days and you know how you start to feel better mm -hmm. and you go I clearly don't need that antibiotic exactly. anymore and you stop and you know that's not what the doctor has prescribed and we yeah. know with ABA there is a prescription right um, and you really need to keep going and, and the, the way that we, we work with our programs with our kids is that we're constantly building skills and we're teaching prerequisites and then building and building and building on skills. Mm -hmm. And so if you stop, then you're kind of probably stopping at a critical stage in the middle of, of your child developing these skills. And, and it's, I really wouldn't advise it at yeah. all. I think it's really good. Definitely pursue the OT and everything as yeah. well. Like you yeah. can complement what you're doing with those other things. Um, and, and don't forget that your your service provider, your ABA provider should be working with you to transit on yes. the transition of your child into the into the classroom and so they should be starting to incorporate skills or um, activities and so on that will help your child transition into school yeah. and support your child in school so that they benefit from it and they do well but without yeah. that support your child may struggle yeah. to, to, to get the most out of that skill placement so it's yeah. really important that you you don't I think that you don't um, stop anything prematurely right and um you know, I, I know I was certainly concerned when we were talking about with my child that we were going to do 40 hours of ABA and then suddenly there was OT and there was speech. Mm -hmm. The thing that our provider, um, our funding provider always said was the child's max of the things that they can have scheduled per week uh, is 40. Mm -hmm. And they set that limit and said, you know, so it has to, the speech and the OT have to fit within that. Mm -hmm. And CARD was fabulous about not starting my child at 40 hours ramping up. Mm -hmm. So that it, uh, that he had a, uh, his little body had a time to uh, acclimatize itself to it. I will say that your your instinct of I don't want to overwhelm my child and I don't want to overwhelm myself. I would listen to that and, and get some help and support because it's a lot. Yeah. It's a lot. And you'll hear us talking about the parent who's running to OT and the parent who's running to go to speech and the parent who's running to answer the door and when is their time to do laundry. And we do talk about that on the show mm -hmm. a lot. That it is a lot to do, but it's so worthwhile. So yeah. worthwhile. And I always try to remember that, you know, are typically t typical kids who don't have any who don't have the difficulties that mm -hmm. our kids with autism have they are learning from their environment constantly they're constantly being presented with learning opportunities mm -hmm. throughout their entire day they you know their play is their work so to speak and so on and so for whatever reason our kids are not getting those opportunities so we're trying to create it's not like 40 hours of work for them as such right. it is work but it's just about creating giving them the same amount of learning opportunities yeah. as their typical peers are getting yeah um and we just have to for our kids we just have to structure it more and actually yeah. go about deliberately creating those opportunities absolutely you know so remember that your uh, kids generally are are, are working yeah. 40 hours kind of they're learning from their environment constantly and yes. growing and everything like and actually even more than that yeah. and that's one of the things that we're going to talk about today is parent training because mm -hmm. we had the 40 hour a week program where we had therapists working with our child either OT speech or ABA 40 hours a mm -hmm. week but his day didn't stop there because mm -hmm. as parents we were trying to power pack every single moment to, for him to have an opportunity to grow and mm -hmm. learn and reach his full potential mm -hmm. and that's a pretty important thing for the yeah. parent to be upholding what's it's happening very important after yeah. um, so in reality you know we we said we were the all ABA all the time channel yeah. in our house as much as possible right yeah. there were moments when and there are still moments when I blow it mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, funnily enough, though, so even in those moments when you're blowing it, that's still there's still behavior analysis going on there. Yes. It's just not going in your favor. It's just, yeah, it's point. not productive. It's right. not efficient. It's not effective. But yes, yeah, it's still going on. There's reinforcement and everything going on. It's just not in your Good favor. Point, really. Good point, Good <laughs> point. You're just but, not in control of it. <laughs> right. And, and I think it is so important, and one of the things that I always say that I love about you is that you accept us as human beings, as parents, and that your expectations for us are not that we become the perfect little B.F. Skinner follower 
doors, um, but that we find a way to be productive within the confines of what we have going on. Mm -hmm. um, and you always make sense. I always use the example that uh, a wonderful person was trying to help me to, uh, to figure out what to do with Jem, and at one point I turned to him and I said, where is my purse in this scenario? Yeah. <laughs> I have a purse. Yeah, I'm a yeah. person with a purse. Yeah. You know, and he and he was very sweet and so was like, oh, right, absolutely. You may need to have a fanny pack for a week or so. Yeah. And then I went, okay, all right then. Yeah. But I think you take into consideration the purse always before I have to say, where is my purse? Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I love that. So let's talk a little bit about parent training, why and uh, how we go about it, all of those things. We've got a lot of time to talk about it. Well, I mean, there's basically... Your kid spends the majority of their time with you, especially very young kids, and so the parent, your par as a parent, you basically are your child's environment yeah. or the, the the bulk of their environment, and so your interactions with your kid um, are what shape their behaviour. Or you're you're the person who's in most contact with them, so really you're going to be the person who's going to have the most opportunities yeah. to teach your child skills or to manage their behaviour. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's the, the, one of the main reasons why we want to do parent training, just to increase the learning opportunities and to increase the, or get consistency with managing behavior and so mm -hmm. on. And also just because it's all very well, you know, me coming into your home and, and getting your child to do something and managing your child's behavior, but if they can't, if they, if they can't, if they don't then behave the same way with you, what's the point, kind yeah. of? Right. Because it's, it's your family and it's right. your quality of life and it's it's not very useful really in, in, the, in the grand scheme of things for a child to do all these amazing things with me right. when I'm not their family or the environment that they live in all the time. Right. And, and there's a built-in frustration that uh -huh. comes and I, and I look at our circumstance because we had therapists come in and start to work with Jem and I... Can I just tell you, it was such an emotional thing to see how quickly they could get him to comply. I just, there was a part of me that I wanted to go bang my head against a wall mm -hmm. and go, oh, clearly it's me then. Mm -hmm. um, but I had to let go of that whole right. rigmarole and go, well, what, you know, how do I need to change what I'm doing to get right. to this? And it's a reciprocal interaction that you have going with yeah. your child. And your child is shaping your behavior and you're shaping their behavior and it's this ongoing dance that you're doing with your kid. Yes. And you've been doing that dance since they were born and a therapist doesn't have that history right. and so they can come in and change the dance they can just do a different dance right they have a lot of training to know how to do the steps right and so they they have more power in in that way of being able to just come in and immediately get your kids yeah. to do what they want yeah they come in and they're the dancing with the stars people right. and they get them to tango <laughs> exactly in the first exactly. day and you go really exactly seriously i've been trying to do a two-step here what the heck's going on but yeah, what was exactly. interesting in us was the trickle down because then i got really motivated mm -hmm. to figure out what i was doing and then of course you know, we got a little further down the road and my husband said, how come he does what you ask him to do, but he doesn't do what I, and I was like, well, bucko, you gotta, you gotta <laughs> learn the steps here. You gotta, and, and then he was motivated. He was like, well, okay. You know, um, so it was this trickle down and then everybody else in the family said, okay, wait a second. Mm -hmm. Um, and got on board. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and we can't. Mm -hmm. We can get on board, yeah, absolutely. and when we learn the steps, then they will do the dance with us. Yeah, and, and, and remembering that, yes, your child's doing the dance with you, but it is a dance with the two people thing. It's not yeah. like you can just go and just do stuff to your kid and they're going to change, because they're, con they're constantly trying to shape your behavior yeah. as well, so you've got to be kind of on the ball and know how to move with your kid, if that makes sense. It does. I mean, having been in it and done it, yes. Mm -hmm. Like, it isn't... Uh, it isn't just stand here, do this, mm -hmm. deliver your line. You have yeah, to, exactly. you have to be seeing what they're offering mm -hmm. and adjust. Mm -hmm. I'm always and talking be aware about of it all the time. Yeah, and I'm always talking about how you know the reason why we talk about ABA so much is that it's a set of tools, but mm -hmm. you have to be creative with them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and that's it's a big thing. It's yeah. a lot to learn. Mm -hmm. It is a lot to learn, but the benefits are are huge. You yeah. know, like you just said that you can change your whole family's quality of life yeah. and you present then opening up a bunch of opportunities that maybe your child didn't have before to learn new skills mm -hmm. and to just have for them to have a better quality of life um, in terms of reducing behavior and so on and the research basically says that um, ABA programs are more effective if you involve parents mm. and that's reality and, and not only just 
opening up more opportunities to learn, but in terms of generalizing skills that have already been taught by therapists, so or on maintaining skills as well. Um, so if a therapist is coming to your home or I'm coming to your home and I teach your kid a bunch of stuff, if I don't involve the family, then the kid isn't your kid isn't necessarily going to go off and use those new skills with you or with anyone else, or, or and, and basically that means they're not necessarily using them in any way that's useful because right. it's not useful for the kid to just be able to sit in in the therapy room with me and tell me all the colors of the rainbow and all sorts of things if they can't go out into their home or out into their community and use those and colors for yeah. their own life. Yeah. So it's really important to involve parents because we know with our kids with autism they don't automatically generalize skills from set across settings or across people or yeah. different materials and so on and they won't necessarily maintain if we don't um, produce opportunities for the child to practice the skill outside the therapy sessions yeah um, yeah and I, for them to be strengthened and I hope everybody gets that that it's it's the difference of just teaching something and teaching something so that it becomes a functional, functional mm -hmm. uh, you know when they really have it mm -hmm. and if you think about you know do you, I think that in the beginning there is a joy that comes with okay my child is teachable mm -hmm. and my child can learn things and that's great but there is another barrier beyond that that mm -hmm. the skill has to become their own. Yes, exactly. Um, that it's not just learning things by rote. Yeah. Um, and, and I, it's it's fascinating the first time you see it. It's the kind of thing that other people go, oh, mm -hmm. when they haven't seen your child for a while, and they go, oh, mm -hmm. it's not just them parroting back. Mm -hmm. I'm having a conversation with your child, and mm -hmm. they're fascinated. Mm -hmm. um, but our kids can build these skills, mm -hmm. but we've got to give them the opportunities. Yeah, and that. So it's very cool. important to involve families in that yeah. and I think as well it's very important to for parent training and to involve families in terms of selecting goals and selecting strategies and, and making sure that what you are teaching is going to be maintained and yeah. is actually what's useful and what's a priority in terms yeah. of their life and quality of life and um, getting buy-in from everyone involved and so on and that you're not teaching a child something that it just isn't compatible with their home environment or isn't going to be yeah. maintained, does that make sense? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, or, absolutely. Or, you know, and like you were saying, like anticipating that things like, where's my purse? <laughs> like yeah. making sure that anything that you're devising is workable right. for that family. with your actual mm -hmm. life. Okay, so we're going to take a little bit of a break, but when we come back, we're going to, because, you know, I know that a lot of you are sitting there thinking, well, I'm already overwhelmed. I need some help, mm -hmm. and now you're telling me i got to learn how to do something entirely different. Where am I going to squeeze that into the mm -hmm. day? that is already too full. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to talk a little bit about how some actual things that you can do to be learning these kinds of things and fit it into your day because it's worth it. It's going to save you time in the long run. Uh, more with Evelyn Gould when we come back. Stick with us. Hi, I'm Shannon Penrive, and this is my son, Jem. We're here today at the Home Depot. You might know that Home Depot is famous for giving free classes to adults on lots of things like tiling and other home crafts. Well, they also have free classes for kids as well. It's called the Kids Workshop. We love doing that, don't we, Jem? Yeah. It's cool. So come on inside with us, and let's do a craft. Yay. The Kids Workshop is a program that's been around with Home Depot um, almost since we've been a company and it's been developed to allow kids in the community to come in and give them an opportunity to build something, to be able to create something and uh, be able to take just simple wood pieces and put them together with nails and hammers and screwdrivers and then paint them. So you do this every first Saturday of the month. Any Home Depot that you go to on the first Saturday of every month between 9 and 12, you can join uh, different associates throughout different stores and, and build these projects with these kids. And do they have to do anything before? or can they just show up on that Saturday? All they need to do is show up. We, we have all the tools, all the, the materials that the kids will need. We have aprons that we give to the kids that they can take home and uh, maintain their pins. They get pins on a regular basis for completing projects. With that, they can keep track of how many projects they've done. And, uh, and it's all free. It's all absolutely free. All Which provided. is wonderful. And absolutely. Wilson, I have to say, you know, you, you guys devise this for all kids to be able to do this. Correct. What I particularly love about it as an autism mom, it gives my child a place to come and learn a new skill to socialize with kids of all kinds. Absolutely. And that's what we're here for. Home Depot is definitely uh, loves to be involved with the community and bring the community in to work with us. That's what we love to do.
Welcome back to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod, and my special guest right now is BCBA, Board Certified Behavior Analyst, Evelyn Gould. We're talking about the importance of parent training and how uh, it should be a thing that everybody is expecting mm -hmm. that they're going to need to do if they're going to do, be doing ABA. Um, but it can feel like it's overwhelming. And um, there are lots of different ways that you can go about doing parent, um, and there are ways of ongoing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm still looking for more training at this point in the game. Yeah. So talk to us a little bit about how we make this happen and what are some of the different well, ways. Well, I mean, I think to some funding sources, they require you to do parent training. They, they absolutely require that. I know that some of the regional centers, they require that mm -hmm. first and foremost. Yep. The parents have to do parent training. And the reasons, I mean, the reasons for that are the reasons that we just said, that the research shows that involving parents is very important in terms of maintaining gains and generalization, and it's a more cost-effective way and more meaningful way of teaching our kids if they, if they can learn from their home environment. Yeah. Rather than having an expert there constantly. Right. Um, so there's like lots of different ways then that you can deliver parent training, and um, you, you know the literature shows effective that all of them can be effective. So we're not really saying there's not really one that's definitely better than the other. I think okay. it probably really depends on what you're teaching mm -hmm. the parents to do, what kind of kid they have, what kind of parents they are, what kind of trainer you have, what kind of situation you're in, whether you live in the middle of nowhere and you don't have access to someone who can come out every week or whether you are doing it at a center or whatever. So there's lots right. of different ways and probably you need, it should be individualized for you. Yeah. So you can have like group trainings mm -hmm. where you maybe have between six to maybe 15 parents in a group and you do a training as a group and mm -hmm. you maybe role play, mm -hmm. you have like lecture, you have practice with feedback and so on in the group, but usually mm -hmm. the child's not present. Your, your right. particular child would not be present. You'd just right. be role playing with the trainer and with each other. And that's, that, that I think can, that's definitely been shown to be quite effective. Mm -hmm. But I would say probably practicing with your child is, is very beneficial. Mm -hmm. So the other way that it's done is one-to-one. -one. Mm -hmm. And that's where you have someone coming out to your home and teaching you how to implement procedures with your child in the home environment or in the community setting, wherever you happen to. I know you've had both, right. really at home and in the community. Yeah. Um, to deal with specific issues or whatever, and that's very useful because you can have a good, you can build up a closer relationship with your trainer, and they can individualize things very much, tailor them to your needs and yeah. your child's specific needs, and give you very specific feedback, which you can't really do with a group setting. Yeah. But the thing about the group setting that you don't get with the one-to-one -one is this so the social support. Yeah. Um, if you're in a group, then you have support of other parents, and you can also kind of learn from other parents, and they can help you problem solve. And yeah. Um, you kind of have a shared experience that you just don't get with a one-to-one. -one. Yeah. Um, and both, but both are pretty effective, I think. And then we also have like self-directed. So if you have, if you're like in a very isolated area and mm -hmm. you can't get access to one-to-one -one or a group, then you can also go online. There's a bunch of softwares mm -hmm. and then there's like DVDs and these kind of different um, technology solutions mm -hmm. where you basically teach yourself techniques. Mm -hmm. And there's not a lot of research out there, but there is some to say that that can be effective. Mm -hmm. But obviously that it's, I think it's a lot harder because you have to put in the time yourself and you don't have someone there supporting you and giving you individual feedback and but you have me. helping you through it. But you have Shannon and <laughs> you Shannon would be one of the other and I And I'm here to support you and exactly. you know I'm always talking about Cardi learning oh. and um, I think I've done every single thing that you just detailed. When we started with a regional center here in California, we, I, one of us, my, my husband or I had to, and it was me, I had to go to a, I think it was two or three hour long group. There were probably 150 parents that were there and it was the basic, you know, talking about mm -hmm. antecedent mm -hmm. behavior consequence, mm -hmm. that they luxury and they, mm -hmm. and they had us fill out forms mm -hmm. and it, it was all of that and an expectation of this is what it's going to be. Mm -hmm. And y when you leave here, you have to sign up for mm -hmm. 16 hours of parent training that both parents have mm -hmm. to be present for the mm -hmm. whole 16 hours. Mm -hmm. And I just remember bursting into tears and at that moment and going, okay, you've told me how great this thing is. You've given me a, you know, a 10 second talk about how this is going to work. And now I got to find 16 hours mm -hmm. without my child, with mm -hmm. my husband. Mm -hmm. <gasps> Right. 
that in that moment was the most overwhelming thing. Now, because I have a really good friend who uh, I'm just realizing that there's two fabulous people's birthday today because it's her birthday today and it's Emily Goodwin, our technical director's birthday today. Um, and my other friend, it, it's her birthday today, said, I will come and watch your child for these consecutive days because uh, I had nobody, and uh, otherwise we could not have done that. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, and, I, and I'm sure I'm not the only parent that that was a huge, yeah. huge issue, but we did, we went and did that, and we were with one other family, and so it was very specific to our, our mm -hmm. different situations, but I got some support mm -hmm. hearing about this other family and, and watching how they were dealing with it. Um, and then, of course, we had one-on-one -on -one training from mm -hmm. CARD. Mm -hmm. um, so I have had, uh, you know, a bit of all of these different mm -hmm. things, and they all had benefits to mm -hmm. them, each mm -hmm. and every one, as you were detailing so eloquently. Um, but I just remember, and, and then, of course, I had the opportunity to do CARDI mm -hmm. learning m mm -hmm. much later after we had started. And I remember thinking, wow, when I did CARDI learning, because... Uh, I'm glad that I went and did the 16 hours of training with my husband, so glad that I went and did that, but only because of that friend I had the ability to do it. And if that friend yeah. hadn't been there, the CARDI learning would have been a lifesaver. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm here to support you guys if you're doing CARDI learning and have questions and say, but I don't get this, you can yeah, ask I think us. I think that if you don't have other options than CARDI learning, uh, you know, the self-directed style stuff is really great way to oh, go. It's life saving. Um, the thing is, I think generally active learning, you know, uh, performance based learning where you're actually doing something and you're getting feedback and you're role playing and you're right. doing stuff, they're practicing with your kid and then getting feedback. Those types of things are, are definitely really important. Yeah. And it has to happen at some point. Right. That has to exactly. happen at some point. And when you've because done the CARDI learning, then you can go and have yeah, fewer exactly. hours of somebody one-on-one -on -one, um, helping yeah. you to figure out. Yeah. I mean, and there's also other ways of getting feedback. It doesn't have to be somebody being being there physically with you. Right. You can have video feedback. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was talking to somebody last week who's doing uh, integrating or doing parent training kind of stuff in Italy actually and he what they find works really well is that they have parents it's a group training and the kids aren't there but they have parents have homework they can choose to do it or not it's completely up to them but they can videotape themselves for 15 minutes or so playing with their kid right and then they bring the videos and then each of the parents shows the videos and they all give feedback and they talk about it and Lovely. it helps them learn how to discriminate what they're doing and just, and also discriminate other people's behavior but their own behavior and kind of contact like what they're actually doing and oh, that's great. it works really good he said it works very very good and it's you know at first they maybe only had one or two parents coming and bringing videos but by the end of it every single parent always brings video that's great and they find that that works really well when they can't get out to being with the parents in the home yeah because we live in a world in which you know you can't always be there but sometimes there's other ways of having it be the next best thing and I love that because we know that sometimes it's hard to take the criticism when it's mm -hmm. you, right? Mm -hmm. And, you, you know, if you have an opportunity to watch the videotape of you doing something and hear the criticism, it sometimes feels a little raw. Mm -hmm. But to be able to see somebody else mm -hmm. making the same mistake that you make, then you can mm -hmm. kind of let up on yourself a and little bit. And if you didn't have an option, if you didn't have the opportunity to be part of a group or something, there is no reason why you can't do the do some kind of self-directed e-learning or something. And then videotape yourself and yes. watch your own, watch yourself. And right. I, I mean, I have, used, I've had therapists do that when mm -hmm. I used to train therapists. It's like, give yourself feedback exactly and when you see yourself you really yes. <laughs> notice a lot of, that you're doing a lot of things that you don't realize that you're doing yes so you know you have options definitely yeah. we actually did that with Jem at one point that mm -hmm. he was engaging in some behavior that mm -hmm. uh, uh, we were talking to him about and mm -hmm. he just didn't think and then we videotaped him and yeah. let him look at the yeah. videotape and he was like oh mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that's I've what I'm doing. Yeah, I've done with kids too, uh, uh, quite, quite a lot actually. It's really beneficial yeah. to see themselves and then they give themselves feedback. Right. Um, it, can be, it can be a great way to teach kids. And um, also another thing is getting spouses, maybe get your spouse, do feedback on each other. Um, yeah. My colleague was telling me about a study she just read where they actually did some training with parents and then in order to get the skills to maintain, they taught the parents how to give each other feedback and wow. discriminate their behavior. And it worked really well in I terms of maintaining that. the skills. I can imagine that because if you, if somebody helped you to direct you to say the right thing, mm -hmm. that's so helpful. Because mm -hmm. sometimes you say something and it can, you know, it can be taken critically and whatever. But if you had, you know, training and being able to do that, I imagine that would be very helpful. I would sign up for that. <laughs>
<laughs> I think my husband would sign me up for that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, so that you know which words to say and to point out, and uh, that would be really, really helpful. So yeah. lots of different ways. Mm -hmm. And not to overwhelm yourself, you know, if you're trying to teach yourself, then start when, you know, do the learning, do the whole thing, but then when you go to actually try and implement what you've learned, just pick one thing to work with. Like, don't be like, I have to change my entire child's day from right. the minute he gets up to the minute he goes to bed. Pick one thing and maybe don't go for the hardest thing, the most major behavior oh, or whatever. Just pick advice. one little thing and practice your reinforcement or practice whatever it is you've learned. On, on, on dealing with that one behavior or that one part in the, you know, maybe it's just the morning or, or just going to bed or whatever it is and not overwhelming yourself. Like shape your own behavior. We talk about it with our kids right. and how we, we break things down and mm -hmm. we teach them steps towards what, what the goal is. Right. And you need to do that with yourself. It's like running a marathon. You're not, you, you know, you can read a bunch of stuff about how to run a marathon, but if you just then go out there and try and run a marathon, you're going to fail. Right. You need to like break it down and gradually set goals for yourself to get there. So yeah. it's really important with your parenting to, to do the same thing and shape right. your parenting behavior rather than overwhelming yourself and failing. Yeah. And I do think, I, I love that. That's such good advice, Evelyn, because I do think when you take one little thing and see improvement, mm -hmm. not only does it decrease the stress mm -hmm. and it, I think it gives you hope mm -hmm. and makes you, spurs you on to do more. Mm -hmm. But when we set ourselves up for, well, it needs to be this and it mm -hmm. needs to be this today, how are we ever going to meet that? Yeah. And then we get into the, uh, you know, mm -hmm. this isn't working. I'm not good enough. Mm -hmm. I can't do this. My child can't learn. Uh, you know, and we're back in that mess, that habit yeah, trail I, mess. Yeah, I think it's really important to be able to do one little thing well mm -hmm. than to try and do a bunch of stuff and, and do it kind of not very well at all across right. the board because right. you're not going to see, it's just not going to be effective. So you're better off just doing the one tiny thing that you can do well. And then if you don't feel up to it that day, just that's okay. <laughs> Yeah. Just go at it the next day. Mm -hmm. But and it really is going to depend on your child and the age of your child and your skill level, mm -hmm. but you know, for instance, for a child that is engaging in a lot of, you know, let's say a young child mm -hmm. who's not yet verbal and they're engaging in a lot of challenging behavior, mm -hmm. instead of focusing so much on the challenging behavior, working on manding. Oh, like functional communication. So yeah. maybe if you know your kid has massive tantrums when they want cookies and they mm -hmm. can't communicate that then it's about just picking that one thing I'm going to get my my kid to some to demand to ask request for cookie right and you can that can be in a different form it could be that you want your child to do a sign or you right. want your child to a do point. a picture or whatever it happens right. to be that you've chosen to do and just focusing on that one thing right <laughs> and not overwhelming yourself with, right. with trying to do everything all at once but that one thing ha can have a ripple effect that once exactly. you've taught the functional communication mm -hmm. of cookie then as a result, the tantruming can decrease uh, in a lot of cases so that it has a far rippling effect. Mm -hmm. And for older kids who are more verbal, you know, picking something else that, you know, looking at uh, what's a skill that would be useful or whatever, whether it's, you know, uh, depending on age, whether it's tying shoes and that's mm -hmm. the thing that you're going to work mm -hmm. on or, um, you know, successfully going to bed, you know, picking, picking something and saying, here's where we can have a benefit. It may not be the be all end all but having uh taking it a piecemeal yeah, a little pick bit of one thing and don't i would say definitely don't pick the most major problem okay pick something that's less of a problem to start with and then break that down into everything that's involved in that one thing and okay. then start with the least challenging step of that <laughs> there you go. so it's like least problematic thing but something that's a problem yeah then break that down into all the things that are involved so yeah. you just mentioned shoes tying yeah. shoes so yeah. You're not just going to go, I'm going to teach tying shoes. You're going to go, okay, what's involved and in what do you do in order to be able to tie a shoe? Right. And that might actually even be teaching another skill. So it might be like, oh, I need to work on fine motor skills first right. before I even get to the shoe. Right. So you really want to break everything down as far as you can and then figure out where you need to start teaching or there where you, you want to start. And then you're going to be successful. Yeah. Yeah, really tearing it, tearing mm -hmm. it down, uh, which makes a great deal of sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to take a short break and come back and talk more about parent training with Evelyn Gould. Stick with us. 
My name is Michael McNemi, and I live on Staten Island. I love hearing myself on the radio. Every Thursday I'm on, it's energetic, it's fantastic. I love the radio show more than a kid loves chocolate cake. I got a lot of followers on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook. This job makes me feel important. This job makes me feel like I have a purpose, like they believe that I'm capable of handling such big responsibilities, and I, I like that a lot. Why is it important for people with disability and special needs to be given the same experiences that a normal functioning person would? We're all capable and can do the same job. It's just the pace we do it in. Some of us need extra assistance. Even Bill Gates can't do some things on his own. He's a trillionaire. Just a little extra support goes a long way. Visit AutismSpeaks.org. Welcome back to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod. We're webcasting to you live from the Center for Autism and Related Disorders headquarters in Tarzana, California. And our special guest right now, as always this time of week, is Evelyn Gould, BCBA, Board Certified Behavior Analyst. And uh, we've been talking about parent training and how important it is and why it's important. And that, you know, it is a little bit of an obstacle to overcome because you gotta find the time and, and the energy. And, and we were talking about starting to use what you know in very small ways and not mm -hmm. trying to eat the whole elephant in one bite. Yes. <laughs> um, but um, that it is worthwhile, and you were saying that studies show that when we, when parents um, are upholding what's happening in a knowledgeable way, that the program is more effective. Yeah, it's much more effective. And then we should also mention that there's other you know, it's not just about the child, and yes, it's very beneficial for the child, for the parents to be involved, but it's beneficial for you too that you can feel, you know, we talked about having a group and then you having more support, and there's some studies that suggest that parent training can really help you with your stress, mm -hmm. and the stress of managing a child who does have challenging behaviors or not knowing how to teach your child skills and so on, so it can be really beneficial for the parents, yeah. especially if you have a a trainer who who understands has a good understanding of the type of stresses that you're going through and can help you problem solve more practical things that you're yeah. dealing with, um, maybe stuff related to the therapy or stuff related to funding or whatever it happens to yeah. be. If someone can give you advice and help you find other supports for the practical things, and then someone who can also help you get over the the kind of psychological barriers that you're encountering when you come to deal with your child. Yeah. And I was telling my colleague about this morning about this. Um, I don't even know what it's called. It's not a metaphor, but it's like a little, this little story thing that someone had said to me at a training I went to, and it was, it was, what is the sign of someone clapping their hands? And the sign of someone clapping their hands is just, sounds like someone clapping their hands. And then the trainer said, well, what's the sign of a child having a tantrum? And people were saying, you know, oh, it's a child crying, it's a child throw. I hear the banging their head on the floor and like screaming and saying, I don't want to, and like all these different descriptions of the behaviors that the child is engaging in. And then she said, well, what's the sound of your child having a tantrum? Mm. And suddenly it became much more than that. And it became like, oh, the sound of my child having a tantrum mm -hmm. is not only all these behaviors, but I'm a terrible parent. I don't know what to do. What am I going to do? Why is he doing this to me? Oh God, what's going to happen to my child when he gets older? Oh, I can't cope with this. Oh, what is this person thinking? They think I'm a terrible parent. Yeah. They think I don't know. Like just this spiel of all these emotional, yeah. really upsetting judgments that the parents are, are saying to themselves yeah. and their feelings about their kid and I got to get out of here. I can't cope with this. All these things. So it's so much more than just dealing with the child's behavior. It's yeah. about getting past those barriers, which can, can stop you from knowing what to do, because you're yeah. not just seeing the child's behavior for what it is. Right, mm -hmm. right, absolutely. There, We always talk about that there's this emotional component mm -hmm. to this that's mm -hmm. not useful mm -hmm. in that moment. Right. I mean, I, you know, our, our emotions are useful and there are emotions, mm -hmm. but sometimes they're just not useful. Yeah. And that it's it's a thing to be overcome. But I I particularly, uh, as I always say, I love that you, you make room for that for us mm -hmm. and that we're entitled to feel that way. And it's not just, well, then cut that off. No. Stop thinking that. No. You know, don't do that, but finding real ways to deal with it because, you know, we can say stop thinking about that, but who can stop thinking about no, it, it's right? it's the elephant in the room. <laughs> yes, it is. 
it is the elephant in the room. But I want to go back to something that we were saying before because now as more and more, you know, there's a lot of good things that are happening right now. More and more funding is being made available for children mm -hmm. to be able to get ABA and in a lot of cases get mm -hmm. the proper amount of ABA. Mm -hmm. um, but you mentioned that in a lot of cases, the funding sources are now going to require. Yeah. So we've given you all the reasons why you should want to do it anyway, mm -hmm. right? But in some cases, it simply isn't going to matter whether you want to do it or not. You're going to have yeah, to do it. Some people are going to require you to do that even before they will start giving you the in-home services or whatever. Yeah. And if you stop and think about it, it makes a certain amount of sense. Mm -hmm. You know, if you were going to pay me to paint your kitchen wall um, I, I would need for you to take the stuff down off your kitchen wall or mm -hmm. it's going to take me twice as mm -hmm. long in which case I'm going to say then you got to pay me more for it right? right and if you know if you're going to uphold what's happening with ABA they're going to pay for it but you got to uphold it or mm -hmm. it's going to take twice as long for mm -hmm. them to do it mm -hmm. so they're going to require you to uphold it mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I mean, I look back to our experience. It's not unusual that somebody does that. We had to go through all of that training before we ever got to have anybody come into our house to help us with a challenging behavior. And I remember saying to somebody, man, this is a lot mm -hmm. that you're putting us through. And the person saying, this is a serious thing. You know, we're going to invest in you and we're going to invest in your child. And we think that your child is worth it. Now you have to show mm -hmm. us that you're willing. Mm -hmm. And I went, okay, I will show you we are mm -hmm. willing. <laughs> I, that's what it takes for me to get, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of help for my child that I, he desperately needs and science has shown is going to help him. I will show up. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that you guys, uh, most of you who are watching, I'm preaching to the choir because you guys have been begging and saying, help, help my mm -hmm. child, help my child. Um, but I think it's important to say that, you know, people are going to have to. And I think, you know, if you are having a lot of fear or a lot of resistance to to, to the parent training then it's, there's probably like those barriers there that we just talked mm -hmm. about like you're probably having a lot of difficult thoughts and feelings in relation to your child or in relation to yourself as a parent and that's kind of putting up a wall between yeah. you and you being okay with yeah. trying to make room for the parent training or so on yeah. so maybe you need some help with getting over that absolutely I mean, I look at my initial thing and I was like bursting into tears and how am I going to have the time? How am I mm -hmm. going to, because my world wasn't accommodating that. That's how far mm -hmm. underwater I was. Mm -hmm. But I will tell you, it's okay to raise your hand and say, mm -hmm. I need help. Exactly. It is. And I did. And I remember crying and, and being on the phone with one friend and saying, I don't know how I'm going to do this. Mm -hmm. And my friends got together and, and the one friend said, no, I'm available. I'm between jobs. I'm going to come and watch mm -hmm. your kid while this is happening. And I'm talking to your <clears> provider, <throat> you know, saying to them your fears, like, mm -hmm. I just don't know if I can do it, it feels too hard, I have no time, you know, just talking through the stuff that's coming up for you whenever yeah. you're, they're asking you to participate in this um, huge, it's a big investment, yeah. it's of your time and energy. So just talking to your provider and seeing what you can figure out because they should, in order for parent training to be effective, you have to collaborate together, otherwise you're just not, yeah. it's not going to work. Like if, we, if the provider isn't able to try and make some accommodations for your family situation or to try and figure out stuff with you, then you're not going to get very far. Yeah. So yeah. just keep the communication up. Yeah, because it isn't even something, you know, when I think about it in that first time that I was going 16 hours, mm -hmm. you know, how are my husband and I going to be in a room together for 16 hours with our child not there and mm -hmm. who's going to take care? And it was such an overwhelming thing. Um, but it's, and and in the beginning, somebody said to me, well, it's just a one-time thing. You just have mm -hmm. to do the 16 hours. But you know what? That was a little bit misleading mm -hmm. because we needed to get on the same page a lot over a couple of years. And mm -hmm. we needed to come to clinics every mm -hmm. other week for a two-hour time period period and be there together we need to make room for that for our lives to change and accommodate it and you can you can we had other parents who said you you know you're going to work it out and we're going to help you work it out and we're going to support you and mm -hmm. and card was very supportive of us of us as well figuring it out you can it feels overwhelming mm -hmm. but you can work it out so don't try try not to do it on your own yes <laughs> no raise your hand and, and ask for help if you don't ask you don't get and you don't tell someone they don't necessarily know yes so you you really need to communicate squeaky wheel mm -hmm. be the squeaky yeah. wheel yeah. be the squeaky wheel Definitely. and get the oil 
know and and say what the issue is we say this all the time to you guys tell us what's holding you back from getting mm -hmm. ABA so that we can help you to work yeah. through it and tell your provider mm -hmm. and tell your funding source um, depending on who the funding source yeah. is I wouldn't be yelling it to the funding source no I would tell your <laughs> provider first yeah I would too you. and see and and sometimes just and having, Shannon, tell Shannon yeah first. tell me and I'll, and I'll help you to sort through it honestly I love issues like that because um, I get it I remember what it was like I do like it was yesterday um, and that fear of oh my gosh how on earth and I you know and the thing I tell you guys all the time that if you had asked me like I was putting on a big front of we're gonna do this and we're gonna make it work but in the core I was like I, I can't do this mm -hmm. I really believed that I was like I I can't do this but you know then you just start walking and amazingly mm -hmm. somehow it happens it happens um, and plus which too you see your child mm -hmm become a happier child and your family work better and you go yeah I'll, I'll invest some more I'll put some more time in on this this is good stuff mm -hmm. autism miracle in my living room um, well Evelyn I just think it's so important that we you know get the word out to parents that they are they are a part of the team mm -hmm. they are a part of the team and a they're absolutely critical part of the team they yeah. are your child's, you are your child's life and yeah. so here it's really really important yeah and and that everybody involved with the mm -hmm. child, you know, um, that I know some of you are out there and you're single parenting and some of you are out there and you're in relationships where you're not in the same household mm -hmm. and, um, you know, that it's that aspect of your life didn't work out mm -hmm. and it's hard and you're having to negotiate things mm -hmm. with people across the country, across your community. It's not always easy. Mm -hmm. um, but if possible to have who you know whoever the significant people are on the same page mm -hmm. is and supporting you yeah supporting you and yeah. helping figure out how they can accommodate your particular needs and situation into your child's program and working with you that's yeah. just the most important thing and it's everything's individualized for your family yeah yeah absolutely it's not always easy mm -mm. you know and sometimes it means working it out with people that you've had enough trouble working things out with but beneficial for the child because mm -hmm. um, I, I know cases people write in and say you know I'm doing ABA and I'm here and the child is having ABA held up but when they go to the other mm -hmm. parents home it's not happening mm -hmm. and that that's that's a heartbreak but mm -hmm. um, you know there are some things to help those parents to understand that there's a difference and sometimes it's a matter of time tough tough stuff but parent participation and knowledge in this is absolutely key for success mm -hmm. okay thank you so much we don't have you next week but we'll have you back in two weeks yes. and we'll look forward to that so Evelyn will not be with us next week um, but we'll we'll find some way to fill the gap <laughs> some way all right we're gonna take a break we're gonna come back uh, for let's talk autism with Shannon and Nancy I'll be joined by Nancy Allspot Jackson so stick with us is a revolutionary web-based program that incorporates comprehensive assessment, curriculum design, progress tracking, and treatment evaluation for children with autism all in one place. Developed by the Center for Autism and Related Disorders, our approach is based on over 40 years of research on the principles of learning and their application to improving the lives of children with autism. How does skills work? Created with speed and simplicity in mind, Skills was modeled on an easy three-step process. Step 1. Start Assessment Step 1 begins with our Intelligent Assessment System, which consists of a series of questions. This assessment is essential to identifying your child's level of skills compared to their typical peers across all areas of development. This includes assessing social, motor, language, adaptive, play, cognition, executive functions, and academic skills. Every skill has an assigned age which indicates when the skill emerges during typical development. 
This means that each child is automatically presented only with lessons that are relevant to his or her age. Step 2. Choosing Activities It's now easier than ever to build an individualized treatment plan. In Step 2, you are presented with an individualized pool of activities that are directly linked to your student's assessment results. Each activity represents a specific skill that has been indicated by the assessment as needing to be taught. Activities are categorized by curriculum and then by lesson. There are three main types of skills, building blocks, fundamental, and expansion skills. Fundamental skills are necessary for successful everyday functioning. Building blocks are prerequisites to a fundamental skill. Expansion skills are non-essential skills, but may provide further enrichment in certain areas. After reviewing the activities available to you, you can quickly add your chosen activities to the treatment plan by simply checking the box and clicking the button. Step 3. Start Treatment Once you have selected and added the activities you want, you are ready to begin teaching. Skills provide you with all the tools necessary to design and manage an effective curriculum plan, such as printable activity guides that are customizable by the teacher, supplemental teaching aids including printable data sheets, teaching guides, visual aids, worksheets and tracking forms, detailed IEP goals and benchmarks for each activity, brief and visually appealing video tutorials, a variety of treatment progress and clinical timeline charts, and lots more. And since Skills is completely web-based, everything you need is available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, in one easy-to-access location. Skills users even benefit from unlimited access to a support community, where they can ask questions and share ideas with a Skills expert. Skills is always with you. I, you see me hard at work here doing uh, crafts here uh, because I wanted to be finished, I'm thinking. Uh, okay, so this is our done token economy system. This hangs on the inside of the kitchen cabinet. And these were things that I specified for Jem because they're things that I know for a fact that he finds reinforcing. So he goes to the kitchen cabinet every morning and he picks one. I guarantee you this one's gonna get the most work out, right? And so he peels it off. Oh, see, I didn't push down hard enough on my Velcro, but I will. Okay, so he peels it off and he sticks it on his little sticker chart where it says, I'm working for. And the green is preset for the behavior. And so he toodles off to school with this. And once he gets to school and all the extra stickers are on the back. So should he get off of green, which we really hope doesn't happen, and go on yellow, and he maintains this now himself. Uh, way back when, when the sticker chart was different, he would have had an aide or the teacher maintaining it. Now, this year, he's really maintaining it completely on his own, so he'll do the morning, and when they go to go to recess, he'll put a little smiley face if he feels like he's done a good job. Um, and he'll have a discussion with the teacher about it on, when it's appropriate for her to say yay or nay. If she says no, that chart, that goes b right back on the back and there's an empty hole. Last year I had work stickers there that he needed to work on it, but this year we're just streamlining it, making it less and less because eventually this thing, and it gets smaller and smaller, eventually it's gonna go away. Um, but in any case, right now he has to get all five smiley faces and it has to be on green in order to get the video games. If I need to change that, I can. Right? I can say, you know, that it, we're going to switch to that it has to be four. I want to put the green back. Um, that he has to be four. You know, last year when we started out, he had to get three smiley faces and be on green uh, by the end of the day. And over time, it changed. So now he's at all five stickers and on green because he should be able to do that. 
in order to be able to play the video games. If he doesn't, then he does not get the video games. That is the consequence. He has to work for it. It's a privilege to be able to get. So this goes off to school tomorrow. This stays at home. And each day he has the opportunity, and there are days that he'll say, oh, no, you know, I want to work for swimming after school. Um, and by the way, from time to time, I will up the stakes and say, you know, if you get this and this, then you can have two of them. Um, and I can work for that. And I even have a wild card on here if there's something particular that's coming up that he wants to do. And we have points this year that we're working for. That's the other one that I haven't put on here. Points. Um, so that if he wants to work for something over a series of days, we're going to move more in that direction this year so that he can get 10 points towards something that he wants to do on the weekend um, so that we're not getting something every day but making it longer and longer that delayed gratification if you want to have just the charts to any of these and I made them in small medium and large um, you can have them you just have to specify email to us that you want the small the medium or the large and if you want the words that I've got typed in the box or you just want it blank because uh, if you want it blank because you want to fill in what's reinforcing for your child I would kind of encourage that um, but we do have the blanks, or you can make this on your own. It just, as I showed you the other day, um, you play on your computer, and these kinds of graphics are available. But we do have them pre-made for you on a PDF. If you want them, all you have to do is write to us. Uh, I want to say again, because I mentioned this briefly, that it is Emily Goodwin's birthday. She is the technical director here. And all of the good things that come to you via Autism Live, can I tell you, they start with Emily Goodwin. So so uh, if you have the opportunity to email us or Facebook or whatever and say happy birthday to Emily because she's pretty special to us and it is her birthday today. Pretty remarkable young woman. I've said Martha Stewart and MacGyver all together. Uh, pretty incredible. So we celebrate Emily Goodwin today and if you want you can write to get the formats for these and we just printed them on colored paper. Um, so you can pick which color is reinforcing to your child. Stick with us. We're right back with Nancy Allspaugh Jackson for Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. Act Today has partnered with Cox Communications to bring inclusion films to San Diego. Led by Joey Travolta, Inclusion Films teaches filmmaking to developmentally disabled children. It's a practical film camp where we take uh, them through the process of making a film. And each group, we split them into three groups, and they're each responsible for making a short film together as a group. How many people like animation in this group? This is a wonderful opportunity for children to build their self-confidence, to develop new friendships, and it's also an opportunity for their siblings to come and to enjoy the company of other peers in this really wonderful, fun setting. Okay, so you know what time it is? Communications has years of uh, supporting the community. We believe in giving back to the communities we serve, and military, youth, and education are our three pillars. And so this really matched up with everything that we're about and what we're trying to do to give back to the San Diego community. And so we were thrilled to meet up with ACT Today and Inclusion Films and to have this wonderful synergy. Three organizations really trying to move towards a common cause. Oh, are we ready? There you go, got it. Come on. Okay, you'll be talking to me, okay? So tell me your name, say my name is. In the past, we've done The Junior Apprentice, which is a takeoff on The Apprentice, uh, The Really, Really, Really Late Show, which is a takeoff on The Tonight Show, and this year we're doing a combination of 60 Minutes and uh, Entertainment Tonight called 30 Minutes Tonight. Okay, good. So now you understand what an improv is. You guys get the idea what an improv is? Yeah. To go with the flow of something, especially in the action. My son Elijah, he's into movies and he's into music. 
and so this program might bring out his particular skills. Amazing, you're like a professional animator. Every single person here we've met has been so kind, loving, and caring. They've given Nicholas the opportunity to be himself and be around people who have the same passion and interest as he does. What is it you learned with Colton? It was really nice to know how much they were enjoying this camp and they're with people who are supporting them and are making them feel great about themselves and their differences and their similarities and I get two kids that are working together and apart and together and apart so it's an interrelationship as well as a camp and a learning experience. Everything that goes into the process of making a film goes into everyday life. So they're learning life skills, they're learning to collaborate and when they collaborate they come up with a product that everybody can see they're a part of something. They become a community, they become a family. When you make a film, you really become a family. Are we having fun at film camp? Yay! Yeah. Yeah. And there we are close to Hollywood. Yes. And Hollywood is always looking for young talent. Autism is an epidemic and it is not going to get any better anytime soon. Families are struggling to pay the bills, to put food on their table, let alone provide services for their children. And ACT Today is a vehicle of support for these families by helping them get access to life supports that they couldn't otherwise have. My experience in film camp has been great and I just really love how I mean, all you guys decided to bring us together. What I learned here, I learned to animate, how to operate the plot board. I learned about the animation and filming and editing. Making friends. Making new friends and acting. Meeting new friends. You can be anything you want to be. Welcome to Welcome. Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. I'm Shannon, Shannon Penrod. And I'm Nancy Osby Jackson. I'm so thrilled to have you here today. And I'm thrilled to be here. Um, it's nice. We've got a good show. It's kind yes. of, uh, we're centering really on the topic of wandering, yeah. elopement, which is so important uh, to parents with Absolutely. children with autism because many, many of our children do it. I don't know if there are any I, statistics, but I, it's got to be high. Percentages, and and I, I know that both of us have children on the spectrum that at one point were elopers. Yes. Uh, so we've experienced this firsthand, uh, how stressful it can be. And, and uh, also just keeping your child safe in a crowd, yeah. maybe where your child might not be a bolter or an eloper, but you know, they might have a tendency to wander off. Yeah. And if they're nonverbal, that can be a real problem, absolutely, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And we have a really special guest with us that's going to join us via Skype right here yes. at the top of the show. Yes. Um, we have and, Matt Holmquist. Yes. Matt, are you there? I am. Hi, thank you for having me on. Hi, Matt. Thank you for being here with us. Yeah, I met you at an autism uh, conference in Anaheim, and I saw your great uh, product and was very intrigued by it, and I'm really happy you're here to share it with us on the show. Where are we speaking with you today? Uh, I'm in Minnesota. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right, well, tell us, Matt, about like so many parents that come up with an idea to service the autism population, your, your idea does come from personal experience. Can you tell us about that? Uh, well, my wife and I, kind of going back, we adopted a little boy uh, at birth. And about the age of two, mm -hmm. we ended up adopting another boy who is about four months apart in age from our first son. And at that time, when we adopted the other boy, he was from Haiti, um, there are some tendencies that, that a, a two-year-old should have had that our first son didn't have. Um, and some other um, uh, unique features about him that caused us to, to have some uh, concerns or questions. So we started looking into it and uh, it turned out um, he was diagnosed to have autism at that point. Mm. Um, and not much later, um, he began eloping and bolting. Um, he left the safety of our own home, wandered down to a neighbor's house, which is uh, just a, about a half a block down, and uh, which is a lake property. And so we found him and his little brother as well um, down at that lake property. And that just caused a, a big concern of ours that, okay, we started looking into that and found the alarming number of children with autism that tend to wander. Mm -hmm. um, 
after that point, he'd tend to wander a couple other times in public settings and again from our own house. So uh, we started looking into ways to try to find out how can we uh, safeguard against this mm -hmm. and what if it happens again? Um, we looked into as many alternatives as we could. Did you find there wasn't a lot out there at the time to help children with this issue? Right, right. And this was a couple years ago. Uh, we looked into um, uh, the, the tracking devices that are there. Uh, we looked into um, other ID bracelets. Uh, we put a fence up, um, uh, the, the door alarms. Uh, we, we tried whatever we could. Um, and we tended to have something with one or the other, like the, some of the GPS tracking isn't offered in our area. Uh, we're in a rural part of Minnesota. Mm -hmm. um, the medical ID bracelets that are out there offer very limited information. You can put uh, just a few lines of information uh, and it's not kept private. Anyone, a stranger could look at that person's wrist and see a name or phone number or something. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to keep it a little more private, discreet, uh, but also offer more information. Uh, that's that was currently being offered at the time. And so they say that necessity is the mother of invention. And what did you what did you finally invent? Well, uh, a few years before that, my brother-in-law introduced me to QR codes. And I was fascinated with the amount of information you could get from just a little square inch. Uh, and so what we tried to do is develop our own QR code that we could put on a bracelet, and and. We were looking online for those, and those weren't being offered anywhere. Now, Matt, can I don't you know explain what, yeah. what QR code means? Yes. <laughs> uh, QR code, QR stands for quick response, and it's a bunch of little black and white tiny boxes inside of basically about a square inch. And when you scan it with a smartphone, it'll bring you directly to your web page or text information. Oh, it's those things on all the advertisements. Right. Exactly. Okay. Oh, yep. I didn't know that's what they were called. I didn't either. See, we get such education, okay. Shannon, all right. on the show. Right. And this can help our kids. Tell me more. Yeah, absolutely. So when if you see our son who has his medical ID bracelet on and it says medical ID and there's a QR code, anyone with a smartphone, whether it's a first responder, a caring citizen, or whoever, your neighbor, they scan it and they're going to get your web page. Uh, we, we design it with the autism child in mind. Um, it can be used for all other purposes as well, uh, but it allows you to put information uh, that we felt was important to us if somebody found our son. So wow. the typical, you can have multiple uh, emergency contact names and numbers, ways to reach them. Um, it allows, uh, one thing that's important to us is calming techniques. Um, like our son loves the ABCs, mm -hmm. uh, so a calming technique would be sing him the ABCs to keep him mm. calm, give us a call, and that way he's calm and doesn't hold until we're able to come get him. That's, that's a brilliant idea. Um, so many of our children do have these rituals and routines mm -hmm. that if, you know, even if a stranger were to use them, they would instantly feel they were in the hands of a safe, they were in a safe place with friends, you know, and know yeah. that mommy and daddy are on the way. Um, so came up with this idea, and I understand there's also um, the uh, fabric. Your son had a problem initially keeping this on, so you further developed a tactile, a sensory uh, approach to this and developed uh, something that would help with that. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, we, uh, uh, like I said, we used our son more or less as a guinea pig to kind of figure out what works for him, what he would keep on, and, and went through uh, trial and error. Um, we, we, we found that the QR code worked great as far as the needs that we saw fit, mm -hmm. but he wouldn't keep it on. Mm -hmm. um, just like any, most children with autism have the, they get irritated by some things easily. Um, so one of the things, uh, and I've got some of them here, if you can see mm -hmm. this, it's, a, it's just a minky, uh, it's a sleeve made of a minky material, very soft, mm -hmm. uh, fuzzy, and our son loved this feel. And this was the only thing that, uh, he basically used it as a security blanket. So my wife created this, developed it, and we put it around the bracelet, uh, we patented the sleeve, and now he uses it as a security blanket. Mm. He doesn't want to take it off, he loves it. it, it it doesn't really lock it in place, um, you know, 
he's smart. He can get out of it if he wanted to. Mm -hmm. But the fact is that he loves the feel of it and he wants to keep it on. And oftentimes he'll want to keep one on each wrist. Ah. Like, like, a little bit, so. okay. Well, that's great. Very cool. So you went about developing this and now you do have this available for the public. Mm -hmm. yep. And how can they obtain, what's the basic cost and where can they get it? Um, well, when we started out, we invested a lot into the, the website. We developed an automated system where we developed the QR code for you. We host your web page, but you have full access to it 24-7. If your phone numbers change, if the calming techniques change, if your doctor's information changes, any of that, you can change it at any point. And that's part of our membership. Mm -hmm. um, since we launched, we've lowered our price uh, dramatically. Right now, uh, for a lifetime membership, a bracelet and a sleeve, it's $50 uh, for all that. Okay. You can buy additional sleeves and bracelets as well. Okay, great. Um, and and how do we have, get it? Yeah, how do they get it? Do we have website information? Sure. Yeah, simply go to our webpage. It's www.keepmesafeid.com. We have it up right here. Yeah. All right, and then just click on, you can read some of the information, uh, hear a little bit more about our story, but you can click on the, the product and, and see, uh, get a better idea of the, what they look like and the, the styles and colors that are available right now. Okay. Um, and, and, and one other thing I'd like to mention, we are, we currently offer, it's not on our webpage right now, mm -hmm. uh, but we do offer shoe tags and stickers. Uh, uh, and you know, we can pretty much offer anything you can put a QR code on. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we're working on getting those on our website uh, shortly, so oh. hopefully those will be on soon. But um, if you're interested in a shoe tag or a sticker as, as part of it or separate, just let us know and we can work with you on that too. Okay, so if a child really sensory can't do the right. rest, they and can put do it on a shoe, shoe. tag. Um, yep. All right, very good. Um, well, Matt, uh, first of all, what's your son's name? Hudson. Okay, Hudson and your wife? Name. Your wife's what's name? That? What's your wife's name? Laura. Laura. Well, uh, certainly Laura and Hudson have been a big part of this entrepreneurial venture. And uh, I just want to congratulate you for taking a problem um, that your family had, seeing a need in the autism community, and creating something that's really going to help a lot of families. Absolutely. And, uh, and Matt, I, you, you had mentioned that there was something uh, that you're looking to get some likes on your Facebook. Tell us what you would like our viewers to do. Yeah, uh, as part of this, uh, the Autism Live, uh, the web webinar that we're doing, uh, we want to offer one free bracelet membership uh, to one of your viewers. Uh, all they have to do is visit our Facebook page. Uh, they can look us up at Keep Me Safe IDs. Uh, and then just like our page and mention the Autism Live show. And we will put your name in a drawing for a free membership okay. and bracelet. Great. Okay, and I'd like to announce that uh, you and I are working on solidifying a relationship that you're going to be part of our safety program at Autism Care and Treatment today, which we do have a safety fund. And as part of that safety fund, we put in fencing at homes and uh, where there's access to tracking devices through, uh, you know, the local uh, sheriffs and whatever, we provide that. But I think this is going to be a great addition to that. So we're going to be talking uh, shortly after this webcast and families will be able to have access through a grant along with some other things. Let's say they want a fence around their home and uh, a Keep Me Safe ID will come with that package. So we're going to set that up with you and I want to thank you for uh, offering to work with us to help many families out there that cannot access or afford treatment. Sure, and if I could mention one more thing that goes along with that, mm -hmm. um, any of our members, if you have our, our membership on your webpage, you can list all that information, but you can also upload a picture of your child. Mm -hmm. We recommend and strongly recommend that you print that page off and bring it to your local uh, police department so they have a record of it. So if your child were to, to bolt or wander, um, you can call them, and they're going to have a picture, description, calming techniques, all that at their fingertips. It's a great idea. Great idea. Absolutely. And we're actually going to um, 
our next segment, we're going to talk about some recent casings, uh, cases of wandering and elopement and their outcome. Uh, some of them, most of them positive, some of them not, tragic. And uh, this is certainly an issue that all families with children with autism need to be aware of. And even if they don't bolt or wander, we need to make sure our children are safe and can be easily identified, particularly for the nonverbal children. So Absolutely. I would encourage this bracelet for families, even if they're a child that's not having a history of elopement or wandering, uh, because sometimes, you know, airports, uh, busy, you know, festivals, things like this, it is easy to get yeah. separated from your yeah. child. Absolutely is. It absolutely is. Matt, thank you so much for the work that you're doing and for taking the time to be with us today. Oh, thank you again. All right. We'll be talking to you soon, Matt. Take All care. Right, bye. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. So we're going to take a break, and then when we come back, we're going to look at some of some these of those cases, cases and yeah. why this is such a huge issue. Mm -hmm. Stick with us. So basically, when we talk about how to teach safety, there are so many levels and areas of safety to teach, but we try to first start off in teaching a simpler level. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, let's say we're trying to teach the child to stay within their yard mm -hmm. and not run out of their yard. The first thing that we're probably going to work on is inside, in a more controlled setting, teach them to stop mm -hmm. when we say stop. Um, or come when we ask them to come. And then when they're successful in the structured, non-distracting environment, then we're going to take them outside to the front yard and teach them, okay, when I say stop, you're supposed to stop. Stop. Good stopping, Jack. We're also gonna make sure that when we initially give them the instruction, we're at a close enough distance that we can help them to stop so then they don't develop a pattern of running away when we've called them and not stopping. Right. Um, once they're consistently responding within a close distance, then we're gonna gradually increase the distance so that they're responding from a further distance. And then we can also teach some kids that here are your boundaries and this is the area you have to stay in. Or um, when we go somewhere, you have to always be able to see me and um, mm -hmm. let's say, or you have to be an arm's length distance away from me. So teaching rules that the child will follow when they go out in public. And, and there are so many different areas. You know, we've been talking about escape and elopement and things like that, but you know, then there's also stranger danger. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that that becomes a dicey thing, and mm -hmm. that I think it's individual to each and every family. Um, you know, I, I know people who say, you're not allowed to talk to strangers. Other people who say, you're not allowed to talk to strangers unless I'm also talking to them if mm -hmm. I'm talking to them. And then, of course, you know, we have to be careful about teaching them which strangers, because if they're lost, obviously we don't want the kid who's hiding in the bush as the policeman goes by, you know, somebody how to recognize who in the community. So there are so many different lessons that I can think of that a child has to be taught in order to fully be able to generalize 100% of the time mm -hmm. how to behave within a circumstance. And we go piece by piece then. So for example, with stranger awareness, we would probably, well, we could possibly teach it through photographs first mm -hmm. and say, you know, is this person a stranger? How do you know that they're a stranger? Um, if they're a stranger, what can you do with them? Like, can you ride home with them? No. Can you accept something from them? No. Well, what if this, you know, giving them many different scenarios, like you were saying, so that they know exceptions of when it is okay and when it's not okay. And then also acting it out as well. Yeah. So I say, um, I'm so-and-so and I'm at the grocery store and um, I'm offering you a sample of candy, but I work at the store, you know, and mom is with you. So knowing when to make exceptions and when it's okay to do something versus not doing something. Um, and then, of course, so uh, sometimes you can also set up a situation. So for example, you tell your best friend that you're going to the store and that maybe your child's never met that person before mm -hmm. and they approach your child and act out something that you've been practicing right. and you know fortunately because you've set it up you know how your child might react if it actually happens so that rehearsing something over and over and over again is, is really going to be key it's very important all right yes 
safety, it's the biggest issue. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you. <laughs>Hi, we're back with Let's Talk Autism. I'm Nancy Ospal Jackson. I'm Shannon Penrod. And we are focusing today on the problem of wandering, bolting, and elopement with children on the spectrum. We just had a very interesting interview with Matt Holmquist, who has developed uh, an ID bracelet that has uh, information uh, for tracking on your child. It's available to the public. Uh, we are gonna be offering that bracelet system uh, very soon as part of ACT Today's uh, safety uh, program. And um, really interesting how he developed this idea mm -hmm. out of, of course, having a child with autism yeah. who eloped. And he yeah. took really his son as a test case. Yeah. And That's he sweet. and his wife worked on developing this technology together. And I just yeah. think these stories are so inspiring how people take a disability and turn it into an opportunity. Absolutely. And we see that every day, don't we, yeah, Shannon? Yeah, we do. And you talk about it a lot. And I love that you talk about it because I think it is empowering for people to hear that this is not the, uh, you know, the end of anything. That sometimes no. this is a new, <laughs> opening the door a to a new, new chapter. Journey. Yes, I actually spoke over the weekend at the yes. back to school conference in Pasadena. I'm sure you were wonderful. It was just, it, we had a crowded room uh -huh. and lots of parents that I don't think have been told, uh, maybe ever, that they are advocates and activists, mm -hmm. even if they're only working with one child, and that really their efforts are nothing short of heroic. Yeah. Truly, true. So, we just want to I'm acknowledge so glad that, that you told them if they'd never been well, told Well, they before. are heroes to us, right? The, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Are you kidding me? Because we we know firsthand. Yeah. And this culture this doesn't often reward, and that includes the educators and the therapist yeah. and yeah. all the support staff that work with our children. Because let's face it, they're not in it for the money. <laughs> <laughs> no. no. Certainly not. Uh, no. Okay. So we wanted to talk about a couple of cases of wandering and elopement that have been yeah. in the news recently. Some of the some of the cases that we were directly involved with. Well, you uh, were because you're you know you're on the scene sometimes. Somehow it just happens that sometimes I'm there when you know lightning strikes. But um, Joshua Robb was yeah. a, a young boy last year who uh, eight year old boy. He had yeah. severe autism and he was found after being lost for more than 24 hours in the San Bernardino Mountains. This was a case that had national attention. Yeah. Certainly all of California was riveted to this because he was in the forest. Yeah. Um, they were very concerned for his safety. The way they finally got him out was they put heavy metal music, yeah. Ozzy Osbourne, so there you go Ozzy, you've done something good anyway. <laughs> Maybe eat the, eat the heads off birds, but you helped an autistic child get saved. And I think that's really how everybody remembers this case because they did. a lot of people keyed into that and thought it was really yeah. interesting that they were that creative right uh, right because you know uh, children are afraid and if they see someone coming towards them especially if you've had them created some stranger danger in them which we want right yes then they tend to run away yeah so that was how they were going to be able to make contact with him was through the Ozzy Osbourne through something familiar yes. that you know he perseverated was, on right yeah it was clever it was right a really clever right. thing that they did so they did get Robbie uh, into uh, at the top time he was in Child Protective Services mm -hmm. uh, we are are following this story because we're trying to get a grant to Robbie. Mm -hmm. It's been rather difficult with all the red tape with him being out of his parents' possession. Yeah. But um, we'll keep you followed up on that. But Robbie is safe. And I that's think that's what's news. important to that know. That's absolutely important to know. Now, then there was another story recently, uh, Shannon, where yes. that unfortunately was not the case. Absolutely. And I think, you know, the, the, the theme, the running theme between both of these cases, uh, and I think that can be present in other cases, is that uh, it's difficult to keep a child safe. It's very difficult. It's something that takes a great deal of work. And, and we see that sometimes um, parents, uh, whether, and we don't know the ins and outs of all these cases, but sometimes parents lose custody if the child is not kept safe. It's, it can be very difficult for parents. And we hear parents say, but I, you know, it, this is a hard job to keep them safe, yeah. but you got to figure it out. Well, that was, that was involved in the, um, in the case with uh, Joshua Wood. He was tethered.
yeah. at a time when, um, I mean, Robbie Wood, Robert Wood, he was tethered at a home with the parents. That's how they kept him safe. They were moving, and Child Protective Services got complaints on the fact that he was tethered, right. and then he was removed from the parents, and he was not in the parents' custody when, when he eloped. He, he was yeah. in the custody of authorities. So sometimes there's a very gray line in yeah. these instances of whether this is abuse or keeping a child safe, yes. in fact. So and, lots of things go into this. And in the case that I'm about to talk about, you know, the jury is still out, literally out mm -hmm. on it. In Orlando, seven-year-old boy, uh, Tariq was his name, and he, unfortunately, in his case, he eloped and was hit by a car and killed. Okay. And, you know, devastating. I mean, I hate these stories, um, but... He had a tendency to wander. There had been previous complaints from the neighbors, one neighbor in particular who had to pull him out of a swimming pool uh, very, you know, close in time span to when this happened that she had pulled him out of the swimming pool. There had been a claim filed with protective services for children. They had come to the home to try to work with the mom and installed locks and tried to inform her and yet the child still escaped on this particular day and loped and was hit and killed by a car and as a result of this I mean you know it's tragic and, the, and one of the neighbors said you know this child did not need to die but they have taken the other children that were in the home out of the home and in their initial report when they came to look at the home they said that the children were clean and, and well, well fed, fed. and um, but the children have been removed from the home and there is the possibility that she could face potentially face cr criminal charges for negligence in letting the child escape it's a very dicey thing and I yeah we don't we know a lot stories. of the whole we don't yeah, know the don't. story this is what's being reported but if anything, I think this points out how dire Absolutely. the situation can become yeah. in a family. I don't see any mention here of a father. Yeah. Um, we're talking about a woman with three children, one who is autistic and who knows what kinds of resources she has, who right. knows what kind of support system she has. Exactly. And sometimes when I read these stories, my heart just breaks rather than yeah. automatically going to, she didn't take care of her children. Yeah. Well, maybe who was taking care of her too. I, I agree, it's a really hard thing to know. And I, I know when, whenever we see a story on the news in my family and there's a child who's missing, uh, whether they have autism or not, our heart breaks um, because it's a child that's missing. And, and then I've seen amongst people that in my life that then when they say that it's a child who has autism and that the child frequently wanders, mm -hmm. I have heard people in my presence, they try not to do it anymore, <laughs> say, well, why wasn't why weren't they being watched why didn't somebody why wasn't somebody on it and we all know that if you know you can be as diligent as you can be and and our kids you know you got to sleep at some point right I, and, you know, and they can, they can bolt so quickly I mean I'm gonna share yeah. with you a couple of stories later about my son Wyatt and his bolting and eloping and how we yeah. dealt with that situation but it was there were times when I thought He's going to get hit by a car. He's going to bolt into traffic. And it happened so fast that there would have been nothing I could do yeah. about it. And so we'll talk I'm, about I'm that. I'm the queen of paranoia. And, you know, my, my friends visited my house and saw the row of locks and sirens and right. things and said, really? <laughs> and my child still got out. Yeah. So, you know. Yeah, I, so we, we can't I always think, look at yeah. blaming the parent here. No, we can't. So uh, then let's talk about Robert Wood. Yeah. He, um was lost in Virginia uh, also last year and um he was gone for a week. This was a terrifying case because it got very cold. This was in Doswell County, Hanover County, which is a very wooded, cold area. And as the week ticked on, there was they they really thought it was hopeless. Yeah, hope, hopeless. Hope, hope goes out so, the, after um, a certain number of hours. He, you know, Robbie was the same age as my son. Um, and but it touches you. I mean, it grabs you. It grabs your heart. You it, just think, wow. I was on um, the uh, on WWBT um, in an interview that day talking about how common this is, and uh, we then found out that Robbie had been found by a rescue worker, and I happen to know that Robbie. Um, 
is part of a family with multiple children on the spectrum, with a family situation that cannot meet the needs, mm -hmm. that is an underprivileged family. Um, and I also am very heartened to know that he is at an excellent school called the Faison School, okay. which I know the administrators there at that school and the mm -hmm. man who formed that school for his own daughter, and it has grown mm -hmm. and grown and grown. Yeah. And when I last sp spoke to the director of the Faison School, um, we had decided to uh, Act Today gave a grant to the family mm -hmm. uh, to keep the children safe. Mm -hmm. We, I believe, put in a fence mm -hmm. and some therapeutic uh, occupational therapy equipment that mm -hmm. they could use mm -hmm. and uh, even some therapy. So that that family, the Robert Wood family, has been helped mm -hmm. uh, by the school and by Act Today. Wonderful. So Wonderful. that's good and news. And he is safe and was found. Out. And now tell me, Nancy, was he the the boy that they said that in, in his case, autism may have actually helped him yes. to survive? Yes, yeah. His, uh, the head therapist at the school uh, who knows Ro Robert uh, said that he was um, the kind of child that was very interested in little intricate things mm -hmm. and didn't have a lot of fear as some of our children don't. They don't right. have a lot of fear and mm -hmm. they don't show physical pain right. at times. Mm -hmm. And they felt that Robbie's probably his fascination with the environment, maybe with some things in nature, mm -hmm. maybe even who knows what he did while he was out there for a week. Yeah. Yeah. When they finally found him, it was right in a quarry. Wow. But um, that it probably kept him, th that lack of fear, that interest in the tiny, minute things he might have found could have very well kept him functioning. Amazing. Absolutely amazing story. And of course, we had another story of a gentleman on the autism spectrum, a more recent story in Utah, who was finally found, 28 years old, uh, in the Utah Escalante Desert, more than a month after he was last heard from. That's pretty amazing. Isn't that amazing? He, he was, was 28, 28, right? 28, emaciated, sitting by a river, unable to walk. Uh, when he was spotted by a police helicopter. Uh, the temperatures, they estimate, rose over 100 degrees Fahrenheit in the three weeks he is thought to have wandered through the desert. Um, he told his father that he was going on a hiking trip, so, there, you know, I, I, I'm assuming there was high enough functioning there that that yes. seemed to be a thing that was okay and acceptable, mm -hmm. um, that he was going with his dog, and then uh, he was not heard from for three weeks. Uh, so, absolutely absolutely amazing that no one had heard from him and that he they estimate that he must have hiked about 50 miles into the desert in those high temperatures uh, and that he survived uh, in some cases eating roots and tree frogs which is pretty amazing pretty amazing story and we're glad that he's okay and is safe of course we're talking about Martin uh, is William Martin Lefevre 20 yeah. years old yeah uh, absolutely amazing they got him out of there and got him to the hospital and I think it was probably just in the nick of time he wasn't able to walk away. Yeah. So these stories happen all the time. Uh, yeah. These are just uh, the tip of the uh, iceberg because I know last year there was a little girl on Hampton Roads um, mm. who was found in a neighbor's pool. Um, I know that time after time we hear stories that don't end happily. Um, this That's is a big exciting. problem and uh, we urge you as parents to get behavior therapy for your children to help with this because that can and help. There is help for it. There is help behaviorally for yes, it. Yes, and we can talk about that a little bit. I want to share uh, some of the things that have worked. I think we're going to get to that in our last segment, yes. something that we did with my son, Wyatt, that worked, yes. uh, which involved a social story, which became a book. There you go. We can't wait to see that. But we're going to take a break first, and we're going to come back and cover some of the stories. There was a lot of news this week that had to do with autism. We're going to co cover a couple of the stories, so stick okay, with us. Okay, great. Well, we have uh, developed a uh, protocol for assessing behaviors in children with autism. And basically, the kids come out into two broad areas, and sometimes it's a mixture of the two. Some of the children we see, uh, we would call wandering. They're, they haven't learned the skills of knowing that you're supposed to stay close to mom or dad, walk next to them, you know, not walk off on your own and just wander off, or um, stop and look at things and not re notice that mom or dad has kept going and turned around the corner and are now out of sight. 
Uh, typically developing children have what we call stranger anxiety and it seems to be uh, have a biological basis and they so they learn to stick very close to mom and dad especially at a very young age <coughs> kids with autism are much less likely to show that sort of thing and so we see this wandering behavior uh, more often in young children with autism than in typically developing uh, kids so that's one group is what we call the wanderers um, and then there's another group of kids that we that kind of bolt or elope uh, and these are children who typically do it for a reason. There's a goal. Uh, sometimes that is when we try to get them to do tasks that they don't like doing, uh, they run away from us. Uh, other kids, uh, when we're not providing attention, they run away to see if we will react uh, to their running. And other kids will run to gain access to what we call tangible items. Uh, and sometimes that is just running to get to the playground, like typically kids would do, but doing it you know, more intently, uh, oftentimes not watching, not when they cross the street, could run in front of a car. Uh, and then also we sometimes see kids bolting for tangible items that are kind of unusual, uh, that the children with autism often have unusual interests. And so we may have a child with autism who is bolting to pick up an unusual looking rock or to go to the elevator and press and stim on the buttons. Uh, we had one little guy that would go to the um, soda machine and it, big, you know, fancy colored lights behind it and he'd go and tap on it and look at it and listen to it and, and engage in stealth stimulatory behavior on that particular object. But that was where, when he ran away, he ran away to that. And so we've developed a set of procedures for looking at the kids <clears throat> starting with a descriptive assessment where we have them walk along a prescribed route and sometimes we bait the prescribed route with things that might tempt a child to run away to get to. Uh, sometimes we give them demands to see if while we're walking with them, if we're telling them to do things, tuck in your shirt, comb your hair, uh, are they more likely to bolt to get away from those tasks we're asking them to do. And so we've developed this uh, set of walks that help us to determine are these children just wandering and don't know when they should stop with us or walk with us? And then we have a set of uh, treatments that are matched to the function or the purpose of the child's uh, uh, elopement or wandering or bolting. The treatment that we prescribe then is a very skill acquisition based treatment to teach the child that they need to stay within arm's length of the adult they're walking with and we have specific procedures for doing that training. If the child tends to be a bolter, then we do a functional analysis to understand why they're bolting, what they're bolting to get, what is the goal or outcome that is reinforcing the behavior, and then we develop a specific intervention to address that function or that purpose. I would imagine though that the assessment that you do, those directed walks, are things that you re are a controlled environment and really need to be done by professionals. Is that true? Yes, and that's where we're at right now, and we start with that. We develop the treatment. We teach the child uh, when it's safe to go and do things, when it's safe to move away from the adult, and then we train the parents to implement the procedures. And um, over time, we want to get so the child's elopement is under appropriate, what we would call stimulus control. They're doing it at the right time when it, they have signals to tell them it's safe to move away from mom or dad, but when it's not, that they need to stay close by. For example, one of the uh, first children that we worked with bolted whenever she saw a dog. She just loved dogs. Uh, and her training went so that gradually we would expose her to different things that she would run away for and the dog was the kind of final test case where she would have to walk uh, about a quarter of a mile, walk right by a dog, go back to her starting point and then we would say to the signal, now it's safe to go and see the dog. And we arranged so that that would occur in a safe location uh, inside a fence and make sure it's a safe dog to be around. Uh, but to teach them that, yes, sometimes it's okay to run and go see a dog and sometimes it's not and here's when it is appropriate and here's when it's not appropriate and teach those skills and then teach the parents to be able to implement that protocol. We hear a lot from parents who f give up. They feel like they're never going to be able to stop a child from eloping and we always like to give them with hope. What kind of success do you have? Sure. We uh, recently pulled together uh, the data from about uh, a dozen cases and the average reduction in elopement was about 95 percent. 
Uh, in all cases, we were able to reduce elopement by about uh, by at least 85 percent. Uh, so, uh, in the vast majority of cases, we can greatly reduce this. In some cases, uh, reduce it to zero, but in the most cases, reduce it to a, a great deal and make it much more manageable for parents. Welcome back to Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. I'm Shannon Penrod. And I'm Nancy Ospa Jackson. And Emily, our, our technical director, <laughs> here, said, no making each other cry before we come back. Because in the break, sometimes we talk about our family situations, yeah. our children, and things that inspire us. And um, We get emotional. We, we do. And we do. Like, so sometimes, on. Yeah, when, when we come back, if you see like misty eyes, yes. it's, that's the reason. Uh, that's why. But we, we've got to cover some news stories really quickly, because I want Nancy to be able to show you this wonderful book that she did with Wyatt. Um, but there were some really important things that I thought happened in the news this week. In, in particular, there was a study that came out uh, out of the Kegel Autism Center at the University of California, Santa Barbara, a study that they had done using three individuals that were a little bit older on the autism spectrum, trying to see uh, if things were put in place if they could be helped socially because that's such a problem for our teenagers and young adults and I, I have a friend that called me yesterday she's got a beautiful daughter with Asperger's mm. who's having such a hard time fitting in with friends this girl uh, is stunningly beautiful which the I'm boys sure boys are after turn. her yeah. the other girls sometimes are jealous of her she tries to fit in she tries to make friends and it's, it's just hard. very hard I mean it's hard for a completely right. typical teenage right. girl I just can't even imagine but what what I loved about this study was that they took these three individuals and said, let's look at where their strengths are and let's see if we can create a club to go with their strength. And one of the examples in the study that they were talking about in the article was a, uh, a young gentleman on the spectrum who had a particular affinity for and was very good at doing computer graphics. Mm -hmm. So they facilitated with the school and created a computer graphics club um, so that he could have people his own age with like interest mm -hmm. be in the club with him and to see what would happen socially if he had the opportunity to be in a club where he could shine. Right. And what happened was they voted him the president of the club. There you go. He made friends. And in all three cases, the kids, when they took that thing that they were good at and mm -hmm. gave him an opportunity, they all flourished socially and said this, the important thing here is that people think that the part of the brain is damaged and that that this clearly shows that it's not that they're not capable of making friends, but that the situation needs to be power packed in their favor. So if you take their interest, you zero in on their interest. Yeah. Let's say your child has an interest in computers, animation, mm -hmm. you get them really into that. You find a club where right. like-minded neurotypical kids can help them. Yes. And I saw this in my own neighborhood where there are two brothers on the spectrum mm -hmm. who are very much in love with plays and drama. And the mother, she, so homeschools them, but she's been so proactive in right. getting them into the community theater, and yeah. inevitably, in every production, they have a leading role. Isn't and all amazing? the other kids just rally around them. Yeah. They have photographic memories, so they, you know, they memorize their scripts, and they have such respect from the other kids. Yeah, and that's what they really found in this. That yeah. they, the other kids were saying, "We want to do computer graphics, but we don't know as much as you." As you do. So you're the you're the head of it, and he was the cool kid in the club, and yeah. uh, and then with all three kids, that there was definite progress socially. Um, so something that we can hold on to and, and very, think about. Very good. With. Okay, briefly, um, we wanted to cover that um, the Department of Defense and Tricare order to provide applied behavioral therapy to autistic children yeah. of military dependents. This is so important. This is something we've been working on um, at ACT Today, ACT Today for Military Families. We've been working on bridging the gap until this type of legislation can occur. And basically, a federal court judge ruled um, on July 26th that the Department of Defense and its military insurance arm, TRICARE, acted arbitrarily and capriciously in okay. denying applied behavioral analysis therapy to military dependents with autism spectrum disorders. Now, we will see where this goes. Um, it's expected to benefit 20,000 children with autism spectrum disorder. Yeah. I do understand that there could be an appeal on this. Yeah. We'll keep you posted on that huge, huge uh, victory. Yes. And uh, I want to mention that uh, 
act today does have our golf tournament hosted yes. by Joe Montagna, who is a huge military supporter and has a child, a, a daughter with autism, and the public is invited to participate. It's on uh, August 27th. Mm -hmm. Go to our website, act-today.org, if you're interested in attending or even coming to the dinner. The dinner yeah. is quite reasonable. You can attend, meet Joe, meet lots of celebrities. I'll give you more on that next week, some of the cool celebrities and, and that are And we're involved. all going to be there. All yeah, of us we're all going to be there, and, and we're going to be taping live. some segments for yep. this show. Absolutely. Uh, one more study that I thought uh, we could follow up on the mom whose son was put into the plywood box that they were calling a um, scream room, a quiet room, I guess in mm -hmm. this case. They had a plywood box that had uh, padding that locked when you shut the door. There was no vent. Uh, horrifying. Horrifying. Um, and she was able to document that her son was being put into that box and she is now suing for $50,000. And I also, you know, somebody said, oh, so it's just about the money. And I said, Said, no, no, if it was about the money, she'd be suing for $50 million. That's uh, right. Because that would have been more appropriate. If uh, it'd Stop and consider if they were locking your child up in a box with no venting, uh, what you would do. I. Uh, this mom is, is clearly trying to make a point. Her name is Mandy Renhack. Uh, her son is Tyler. He has Asperger's. Yes. And uh, a 5 by 7 padded room built of plywood with hard tile floor and no ventilation, no child should be put into. Absolutely not. So. And, and put in there because of his behavior. Yeah. And here's what was interesting to me that I particularly want to draw attention. Uh, Don, Donald Childs, who is still the superintendent of the Wapun Schools, said to the Fox 6 News uh, crew, he said, well, you have to do what the rules say you have to do. That the child had not been, this child who has documented behavior problems, he said, well, in response to why was this child being locked up, well, you have to do what the rules say you have to do. That well, to me, there is no rule that overrides the rule to treat every child with well, dignity. Hello. And, and the mom's response was, you don't lock children up, you help them. Yeah. And I think that's the core of that. And if it were about money, as I said, 50 million, yeah. not 50,000. Well, I think uh, most of our viewers We'll side with the mom on this I one. I think so. But uh, I, I don't even we, want to go to a break. Okay, let's I not don't go to want a break. To go to break. I okay. want to talk about this All right. book that you did with Wyatt. All right, let me talk about Wyatt's problems with eloping. Okay. Um, he would have problems. We would have problems him running to the front door. We did have bolts on them. Sometimes those bolts, people forget to lock them, whatever. He would run out that front door. He would run down our street mm -hmm. and then run up another street that basically is the uh, entrance to the 101 freeway. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Terrified when this yes. happened. Several times I would realize, I'd hear him open the door, I had realized the bolt had not been locked, and by the time I got on shoes, if I was barefoot, I, I was hightailing it, and this child is fast, yeah. let me tell you. Yeah. So we started working with therapy on, and also would not want to hold hands in parking lots, mm -hmm. going into places, you know, run up ahead at times. So we started a social story, and Wyatt actually wrote this social story. Now we did this when we spent time in the hyperbaric oxygen chamber, which is a therapy I tried, and I'm not going to get into that, whether it was beneficial or not, because I'm not really sure. Okay. But we would go into the hyperbaric and bring crayons and or bring magic markers and paper. And we decided to write a story about a little monkey named Sammy. Okay. And the name of the story is Sammy Learns to Listen. Mm -hmm. And Emily has graphics up there. Now, Wyatt drew most of these. As you can see, this is really? not... Okay, so Sammy Learns to Listen by Wyatt Jackson and Mommy. Mm. And, and Wyatt literally came up with all the storyline for this. this. So, Emily, if you'll go to the next one, it, we wrote that once upon a time, there was a little monkey named Sammy. He loved to go places with his mommy monkey, and he loved to go to the zoo. So there you see Sammy going to the zoo and getting a ticket at the L.A. Zoo. And his mommy said, you must hold hands. No running up ahead. So they went to the spider exhibit, and what happened, lo and behold, Sammy did not listen. He ran away. I love the expression on the mommy monkey's face. Okay, yeah, and there's the spider. <laughs> and this actually happened. Wyatt got scared at the spider exhibit uh, and ran out of the room, and I had a hard time finding him. Okay. So, Sandy couldn't find his mommy when he went to look for her, and guess what? They had closed the zoo. Mm. Okay, this is 
And look at Sammy. What's he going to do now? Yeah. Zoo's closed. Mommy's right. nowhere to be found. Right. So Sammy went, we had to spend the night in the zoo, basically. Mm -hmm. So Sammy went up to some animals, and he would say, my name is Sammy. What is your name? And I love that all the names of the animals, why I picked it, had alliteration. There was uh, Tony the tiger. tiger of course. And Tony said, you better go back to your mommy, little monkey. You better learn to listen. And then we had an array of animals that Wyatt came up with. Uh, let's see, what do you have next, Emily? Probably, oh, Jerry the giraffe. Okay. Jerry said, uh, my name is Jerry the giraffe. You better go back to your mommy, and next time you better learn to listen. Then there was Gregory the gorilla. Sammy's crying by now. Right. You better learn to listen. Uh, I think there was a zebra named Zach. There was, uh, oh, this was one of my favorites, Doki the Dino. Doki the Dino. Yeah, he, he had a dinosaur at the museum, and I love the names he came up with these. Yeah. Um, Very clever. A seal named Seuss. Okay. Now, I would never have come up with the name of a seal named Seuss. That's wonderful. Okay, well, what happens is that the next morning they open the zoo, Sammy finds his mommy, and he promised his mommy, I'm going to be a good listener from now on. And she said, I love you more than anything in the world. And to celebrate, he danced the Macarena with the animals up on the stage. Oh, very fun. Okay. Very so fun. this is how my son, we turned it into a social story. And now when I, when, whenever we go anywhere, I say, what are you going to do? And he says, I'm going to hold your hand. And what are you not going to do? I'm not going to run up ahead. Okay. Okay. So you can make it fun. And social yes. stories can be immensely beneficial because kids remember them. Yes. I, and, you know, it's interesting. We had a question earlier in the week that was posed for both of us about, uh, it was somebody actually asking about how do you talk about autism after we had had Danny Bowman on. And, yes. And, um, and so I talked a little bit, and, and you and I had had a conversation after Afterwards. But I was mentioning that, you know, we made a, a book for Jem um, to be able to tell him over and over again that we eventually shared with people. And you've done the same thing here. Okay. Making yeah. a social story that for anything, um, and, and let's remember that, you know, anytime you want to talk about social rules, yeah. what you've done here is so clever because you can share it with somebody else, but that you got to sit and do this over and over again with Wyatt and you put it together in a way that's durable. Mm -hmm. So you can share it with him and you can share it with others. And, and people can do that at home. Yeah. You can do that. You can do that. And go over whatever the, the rules are that you want them to know. It makes it more fun. It makes it fun and it makes them proud that they've written Absolutely. something about it. Absolutely. Wyatt loves to get it, this out and read it to his therapist. So I want to know how, if somebody wants to get this book for their children, can they? Well, you know, I think we only have a couple of copies left that are okay. hardbound. We're looking into right now, making a few more. Okay. But they can write us at Act Today. Okay. They can write you here. Okay. And we'll, we'll, we have a couple of copies and we're looking at making more because I okay. think it's just really fun and I don't want it, it to really end. No. I think and children seem to love it. Why it's gone to some it's kindergartens and sweet. read it. Yeah. And children really relate to it. This That's little great. monkey that disobeys and gets stuck in the zoo for the yeah. night and learns a lesson. Absolutely. And now he's moved on. He's written we haven't put him into hard copies, but he's had Sammy runs away at night to the mountains. He's got Sammy ran away at the aquarium I and he talks it. to the sharks and I you know, it. so he's continued. There may be a whole series of Sammy books. Absolutely you never know. love it. Absolutely love it. Well, we're pretty much out of time yeah. here. Um, and but next week, yes. we have Elaine Hall, don't we? Yes. Am I wrong? From Elaine Hall from, from the Miracle Project. Yes. And Autism the Musical. Autism the Musical. Yes. So that will be a She's really exciting show for us next week. And we've yes. got some really exciting things coming up in the weeks uh, we to do. come. Um, so you're going to want to stick with us. And we're also going to talk about uh, the golf tournament more yes. next week. And, yes. Which is coming uh, right around the corner. It is. Getting it's ready right for that. Corner. But want to remind all of you to be in touch with us, whether it's on Facebook or through our email. I know we don't have time to run through all that, but uh, thank you all for being here. I want to remind you, we won't be back till Monday, uh, but until then, give your kiddos a hug from me. And catch the joy as it flies out the door and join us next Wednesday for sure when Absolutely. we have more of Let's Talk Autism. Goodbye for now. Bye.